Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and we have our normal crew with us here today, Trainer Road and Cannondale's Amber Pierce. Good morning, everyone. Our head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hi, everybody. And our CEO, Nate Pearson. Hello. We're going to answer more of the cycling and triathlon related questions that you've submitted at trainerroad.com slash podcast. This is episode 289, everybody. Uh, pretty crazy uh, that we're already that far along a week ahead of a big holiday here. So we'll actually have an irregular episode next week. It'll just be a short one. Uh, so look forward to that. Uh, but just the same, you can check out the forum, go to trainerroadcom slash forum and search for episode 289 for all the information from this episode. And thanks to everybody that's joining us live on YouTube right now. Give us a thumbs up if you're joining, because that will make it rank higher, push to more cyclists, more cyclists will be able to join us live. And you can see uh, cool things like Chad's very mood, nice mood lighting that he has going on today that you just can't I, see when you listen to the podcast. I think I'm the only person in daytime, like daytime time zone. <laughs> oh, <what else> <laughs> yeah. yeah, mine's all controlled lighting. Yeah, yeah, you have yours wide open. Uh, Nate, we have something that we should say first thing, uh, a, a, a well wish of sorts. Do you want to kick it off? Well, okay, yeah. Happy birthday, Christopher. Christopher yes. is a listener and a podcast and train road fan. And uh, he's working towards some goals. And I don't know, John, what do you want to say? Yeah. Nancy Schwartz, uh, his, his wife, she reached out and asked us to, to include this in there. Super exciting. Uh, really cool. Thank you for listening to the podcast and a happy birthday for sure. I actually want to share one thing. And the reason that we definitely had Nate, uh, uh send you the well wishes here at one of, and this is from, uh, his wife. She says at one of Christopher's first mountain bike races, our kids cheered him on holding up homemade signs with inspirational phrases. And one of them read be like Nate. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Hope maybe they were talking about making sure your bolts were torqued down. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, that would be don't be like Nate. <laughs> <laughs> but it's awesome. Uh, he's so he's prepping right now. Uh, so some of his goals that he's working toward: three point six watts per kilogram. He wants to qualify for the top notch wave uh, at the Mount Washington Auto Road Bicycle Hill Climb. That is a brutal climb. Amber, have you done that before or climbed that? Uh, Which one? one? Uh, Mount, Mount Washington. Washington up no, in the I haven't done that one yet. No, but that, that is epic. Yeah. It looks brutal. Uh, gnarly climb out, out in the Northeast. So, so happy birthday. Uh, pretty exciting stuff, Christopher. Happy birthday, Christopher. T- 21 Amber years Chad old. You look great. Happy you. birthday, Christopher. <laughs> hey, I was I just can... waiting my turn. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were moving on. It's <laughs> like chop, chop. <laughs> also, if you're listening no, not to this, chop, you should... chop. I thought we missed it. Sorry. Oh. No, 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 no. <laughs> If you're listening to this now, you should totally be listening to the Successful Athletes podcast. Last week, we talked to Laura Lanya, and I mentioned about this on the podcast, but she moved from Cat 4 all the way to Cat 2 in cyclocross, and we talked about everything that she's learned along the way, how she trained for it, things that she's done, how it's changed when she's changed categories. Next week, as a little teaser, you're going to get to hear from Cam Siemens. So he's a med student right now. Um, he's almost had a 100 watt increase using Trainer Road throughout that process of going to med school and doing the whole stuff. He's done crazy ultra distance uh, races on low volume training because low volume is just simply what his time allows. Some mid volume stuff when he can. Uh, he's also done some ultra marathon running, like some long distance running races, and he still maintains a low volume plan while he does that. So we talk about that and the reasons why behind that. Anyways, super cool. Uh, so check out that episode. There will be a link down below in the description here. You can just search Successful Athletes Podcast on whatever you're on, and it'll come right up. Tons of people are listening to it. And if you're not listening to it yet, you're missing out. So check it out. Um, we also, I, I we need to make a clarification because on episode 287, we talked about bike fitters and I listened back to it and I was like, ooh, it sounds like we really like, gave bike fitters a, the, the raw end of the deal. We are like, you know, it didn't seem like we actually recommended a single bike fitter ever. I just want to clarify that good bike fitters absolutely exist and they're very mm-hmm. important and we should I, go see good bike fitters. Yeah. I don't know who said that. I hope it wasn't me because I, I do not want to give that impression at all. I liken them to personal trainers and that it's something you can get certified in. And some people take that baton and they run with it and they get very, very good at it. And some people just phone it in and they should be issuing apologies and refunds. <laughs> uh, cycling that's coaches a, too it's a really good way to put it yeah absolutely it, it is, coaches are another not, good example mm-hmm. how long does it take to be a certified cycling coach like it, the first level it's like a couple hours that's mm-hmm. it yeah. yeah yeah i think everyone who's listening could be a certified cycling coach you know enough By end of day yeah mm-hmm. and a lot of it's like like i should not be alone with a kid in a room by myself right yeah. like it's yeah. like comes common sense stuff like that uh right that's not even have to do with cycling it is crazy uh, not hard. So just because someone says 
any of that stuff. I think a good one is uh, reputation, right? So sure. like if there's a bike fitter locally who a lot of people say, this is the person to go to for a great bike fit. I think that's a really good, a good measure is word of mouth on that because it's really hard to measure uh, qu uh, qualitatively, quantitatively, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, if someone is a good bike fitter or not. Yeah. And these sort of clarifications, I think help a lot of the time it's tough because we, we are saying something, working through a conversation, this dynamic, trying to get to a certain point, something like that. And then when you listen back, you're like, yeah, we didn't hit the mark. Uh, so we make mistakes and, and that, that happens. So, uh, I just want to clarify that anybody that's a bike fitter out here or that's listening to this, I apologize. Uh, I apologize if it seemed like we were invalidating you in any way or like that. Um, if you do good work, you should be proud for that. And we all need bike fitters. So. Uh, we didn't mean to to step on any toes there. I apologize. So, uh, with that email, do we get hate email? Did we get it for that? <laughs> yes, we did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I get many <laughs> last week. Actually, I got a person sending me a count of three different words that I said uh, repeatedly. So they'll like send me like 362, you know, not that it's that many, but yeah. So we get lots of critical feedback all the time. Lots of room to improve. Uh, so, <laughs> Uh, I want to do a follow-up on something. It's a question we've been meaning to get to, and we haven't been able to get to it for a couple of weeks. And that's actually, uh, Nate, you mentioned, and Chad, you both mentioned this product some time ago called the Uller. Can you explain what that is now that you've had it for a while? And this yeah. is not some sort of sponsored review thing yeah. at all. The question that was being asked is how can I improve my sleep? And I sleep hot. That's like a really common thing that we hear from people, um, too warm when they sleep. And as a result, their training is being compromised. I want to say three things on this too, because it's, it's, I don't want it to sound like an ad. I bought myself an Uller and what an Uller there's like a, what the Uller is that I bought is a pad you put underneath your sheet and it's a water cooling system, much like a computer where you set the temperature via your iPhone, you set a schedule and you can set specific temperatures down to very cold where I'm extremely cold to very hot. I bought that some listener at CES, I think maybe it was this year, no, the previous year, um, somewhere talked to Uller and said, Hey, I heard about in this podcast, Uller reached out to me and they sent me a water cooled weighted blanket. I actually did not like their weighted blanket <laughs> and you had to have two systems. And then they yeah. asked to advertise on our podcast. I'm like, we don't advertise on the podcast. So, uh, I gave away the weighted blanket one. I just have the, uh, the pad that I bought retail. And then Chad, did you buy the pad retail too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bought it and I returned it after it broke. And then I bought another and I returned it after I broke. So unfortunately, I don't have good things to say. <laughs> and my Shoot. sister's uh, <laughs> is making a really loud noise in her fan. Does your fan make a loud noise? That was the second. The first time it just stopped working. So I couldn't understand why it wasn't cooling down. <laughs> and then the second time the fan did exactly that. Got real loud. Okay, so, but hopefully if you, if you, it's, so they're really expensive too, by the way. Like, and they had yeah. good, really good customer support. They were going to send me a third one. I just didn't feel like going down that road again. I mean, fool me once sort of scenario, <laughs> but it's free. I mean, okay. All anyway, right. so the <laughs> ruler, I got it. I got, I got my dollars back, so it's not free. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, okay. I love it. I can't <laughs> sleep without it. So that's, that's my opinion of it. I love it. And, uh, if it did break, I would email them again and keep getting them until it stopped breaking. Chad, did you like it's it when you used it? Yeah, when it worked, I liked it a lot. It, it still wasn't quite pulling it off though, because the uh, I still can't find the balance of what goes on top of me. The heavy blanket is just a secure, comfortable thing to have on top. But man, I heat up even with the Uller mm -hmm. cranked down to its lowest low temperature. I, I'm still a very hot sleeper. Yeah, yeah. So this it's really important too with the Uller to put in either their cleaning solution, which they don't tell you about, which is like five dollars a cleaning thing. Did that. Or you put in some bleach because I had one pad where it gets like funky inside. You have to put mm. the cleaning stuff in it or else the water won't circulate. And uh, can I talk about my other sleep setup? Because we haven't talked about it for a while. And I think it's just important for people to know. Yeah, because this is like a, a so and I and yeah, absolutely. And if you don't mind, like a quick interjection with this, because mm -hmm. so this is something where a lot of us might not realize that we're actually uh, leaving some low hanging fruit on the tree, so to speak, in the sense that small tweaks. Now, granted, the Uller is not a small tweak, stuff like that that's really expensive. That's, But there are some small things that we could do, like thinking about, oh, like what about the sheets that I have? What about the blanket do I, that I have? Can I change that up and then be more comfortable and wake up less in the middle of the night or just sleep a little better? Uh, man, most times what we do is we look to change 
we've experienced the discomfort during the workout. So we look to change the workout first, but in all reality, if we change the other things and it's probably even easier to change, but the other things about how we recover and what we're doing when we're not on the bike, we would likely be able to uh, complete that work as it's prescribed. So this is the whole intent with this is when optimizing sleep is about making your workouts more effective and more feasible. Like you can do them. They don't wear you down quite as much. You can absorb more of that stress that you're getting from them. So that's the intent behind all this. So yeah, please, Nate, all the other things that you do to get better sleep. Let's do it. I want to talk a little bit more about the Uller. So, uh, when I go to sleep, I'll just, I'll tell you my setup. My bedroom is 60 degrees, which is cold. I have two 20 pound weighted blankets on me. Okay. Wow. And there's like, not the fuzzy kind. I find those really hot. There's this kind on Amazon and I'll put it, I'll make sure we get it in the forum notes. Um, cool. that's kind of like pleated and that one works really well. So I am like, it has pushed me down. I have a face mask on. I have earplugs. I tape my mouth with a uh, 3M paper tape, three inch, and I have a CPAP on. <laughs> We've <laughs> so covered this before. Taping the mouth, do not do that. That is not recommended by us. We're not saying that you should do that. Nate has this because of a CPAP because he doesn't want air leaking out and drying his mouth. Yes. And uh, it, no, it wakes me up. And I know chin straps, they do not work. I, I have to tape it. So before everyone messages me, I've, I really don't <laughs> want to tape my mouth. I've tried a lot of stuff. <laughs> I've tried the dental device. I know there are surgeries. I know there's an implant I can get in my chest, but I don't know if that will work. Anyways, I'm fine with my, my setup. So this what sounds I do like is- a ter- Sorry, dude, but this sounds like a kidnapping. Smash Nate under a ton of weight, tape his mouth, <laughs> cover his <laughs> eyes, make it so he doesn't Ears. hear anything. <laughs> um, so I don't know if I've said this in the podcast before, but this is a side note. Uh, duct tape, taping your mouth does not work. So all in the movies, when they say it hurts, duct tape does not hurt. You can, you put it on, it just falls off. And if you get it wet with your tongue, it'll just fall off. So if you get kidnapped with duct tape, don't worry about it. You can, it, it's super easy. You have the to tips like- you never thought you were gonna get maybe, on maybe trying not licking it. No, it's the, it's the natural oils on your face. It does not stick to your face. So the, the, the paper tape, you gotta like really clean your tape off, your face off. And then I usually stick a few things to it to get it really clean. And then I, I do one after that. But anyways, that is a- You're not alone, so Nate. There's somebody, there's somebody in the live chat that also uses tape and they said they, it helped a lot. So you're not alone. Cool. There we go. Um, but sometimes going to sleep, I am extremely hot before I go to sleep. That's either because of a shower or because I drink like tea or something. And mm-hmm. then for the Uller, I set it down to like 55 and I get physically cold before I go to sleep. And then I set it to my, I think I sleep, sleep at 86, which is higher than they recommend, but my room is very cold. Um, and then, uh, during the night it'll switch. So like, sometimes I'll wake up like for 86 at four in the morning, I might be extremely hot. So I'll have it uh, knocked down to like 82 at three o'clock in the morning. And then based on when you wake up, that's how I, I do it to figure out when I should be, uh, what temperature I should have at what time. I'm not in flow today. Oh. <laughs> okay. Can we change subjects? I got something that would be flow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Take it. Okay. So I got a message. You guys know about it. And I might have the opportunity to be a pilot <laughs> for the, uh, like a paracycling. So on the bike with, with a blind athlete and I would be driving and we would go to uh, a qualifying event in, I believe, Virginia in April. And if we do, if we go 29 miles per hour in like a 30 or 34 KTT, we have the possibility to go to the Olympics, oh, which is so amazing. cool, right? The Paralympics <laughs> in Tokyo. So you better believe I am all in for this. <laughs> and then I was, I was chatting with Jonathan and Keegan and Ryan Sanish and if we get a tandem bike, so we either have to find a tandem bike or buy a tandem bike. But if we have a tandem bike at trainer road, this opens up so many possibilities. <laughs> it does. doesn't it chat. Mm. Um, <laughs> I showed... <laughs> so <laughs> I, I so know excited. that Chad had, had this reaction. <laughs> and uh, although Jonathan told me that there is such thing as mixed or co-ed national champion masters racing. And there are two categories, TT and road race. So Amber and I, can you all think (laughs) of all the women in America, who's a master's athlete, who would be a better, and you should be pilot on both. Like, can you imagine a road race? You would just have like an extra 
I don't know, hundreds of watts as your engine, and you get to do all the decisions in a road race of tandem, which I think is just weird in general, but I would totally trust yeah. you. Um, like, no one's going to have more experience with you. Uh, you for oh, As yeah. far as women go, you're going to be awesome. They're always pretty flat because, you know, you get downhill on a tandem. We're going to go like 60, 70 miles per hour. Uh, so oh, we're yes. both big. And it'll be awesome. And then for <laughs> seated sprints, which I think I'm guessing a tandem would be a lot of seated sprints. It'd be very hard to get the timing right on. <gasps> can you imagine? Out of saddle. Out of saddle <laughs> sprinting on a tandem. Oh my but gosh. I can, <laughs> I can do 1100 watts seated pretty easily. And I can probably train that higher. Not easily. All out effort. Max effort is 1100 watts. <laughs> But Amber, we could do both of those. And then for the TT, you can get down arrow. I could be the person in the back and I could have a little bit better hip angle. And I think we could even go to the wind tunnel. But imagine if it doesn't work this year because of uh, COVID vaccines, we could do it the next year. But I I mean, would you be down? I think we should ask the listeners too. Would they? <laughs> what do you think? Amber, what do you say? Sounds amazing. Sounds yes, amazing. you're into it. <laughs> Masters get, TT that champ. It'd be amazing. Mm -hmm. oh, it'd be so we could good. go to Worlds. We could be yes. world champion. <laughs> yes, you could. <laughs> Amber's faces. <laughs> she likes the idea, but there's hesitation, I think. There's so much I, laughing I'm that you can't this. hear her laughing. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm nope. trying really hard to imagine the road race. Like, it's just, <laughs> that's amazing. It's terrifying. That's amazing. I think we put GoPros on and we film it. We do analysis afterwards and we just go back to front because acceleration is probably going to be hard. But I think breakaways would work really well. Uh, or actually solo breaks too, because it's got to be hard to organize a, a pace chase line with tandems, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, I would imagine, yeah. Everything, be everything has too. to be different. My goodness. <laughs> but but anyway, sometimes I guess are the wild. same. Yeah, the TT would be fine. And I think there's track too. We could do track mix. Isn't there track <laughs> mix or not? I think there is actually. Yes, I think there is. Somebody let us know in the chat, but that yeah. we could definitely do well in that too. It's amazing. <laughs> if you like this idea of tandem uh, national championship chases going on by Nate and Amber, and of course, <laughs> Nate and Chad as well, um, let us know and send your vote of support into us so that we can, can motivate the troops. I actually, um, yeah, go ahead, Nate. I don't think Chad's going to do it. So I don't, uh, <laughs> Chad's not going to yeah, jump on so, behind me. And do it. Maybe Pete. Chad's not giving Pete anything away. Would. Chad, Chad's poker face is like full on right now. Yeah. Pete's a hundred percent in. I already know. We don't even have to ask yeah. Pete. He's all in. Pete he's he's in. into that for sure. So, okay. And then just to reiterate one more time, next week is going to be the holiday break for us. So uh, we'll have an abnormal episode, but it won't be the normal crew here. It'll just be something super short uh, for y'all. So stay tuned for that. Um, and then when we come back from holiday break, uh, I will have a very big, oh, a big announcement to share with everybody. So that's one that Nate in particular is very excited about, and he's been wanting to talk about this for some time. So <clears throat> we'll get to talk about that next week or not next week, the week after, uh, <laughs> Nate looks like he's questioning something. I don't even know if what you're talking the, about. If you look in the doc, it'll all make sense. Nate, there's an emoji that will make it all make sense to you. <clears throat> so, okay. Next, uh, let's go into the questions. Uh, this one is, we're just going to keep it anonymous, uh, for, 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 I think, understandable reasons, but okay. Reasons which shall become clear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, says, Hey all, I finally decided to pay my way around for listening to countless hours of podcasts and videos. Now that I'm not being coached anymore. My question to you is about drugs. First of all, thanks for signing up. Pretty cool. Uh, but my question for, for to you is about drugs, especially SARMs. And when I'm saying that that's S A R M S, uh, there's been a lot of conversation about them. Even some pro triathlete being uh, pro triathletes being busted for using them. It's an attractive drug since they're, and he says this, and I'm just going to use some very, I mean, very pronounced and heavy quotes here. He says, it's an attractive drug since there are no side effects. And that's yeah, an assumption. Please keep listening. If you don't <laughs> yes. stop it right here, because yes. there are side effects. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and can help with your endurance. This is something strictly for the folks that only want to get stronger and not the ones that race. So what do you think about them? Any recommendations? Uh, love you all. And finally, and he says, I'm finally glad I'm paying my way, way around here with my monthly contribution. So thanks for signing up. And hopefully we can answer this question and provide a lot of insight because these are something that if you're looking, if you're part of, I don't care what sort of human performance uh, forums or communities online, these sort of things are getting discussed, SARMs. So uh, let's jump into them, Chad. 
Yeah, I think we should start the clock too, because I feel like this one's <laughs> going to go long. Okay. <laughs> so, anonymous. Actually, general audience, let's talk about what SARMs are first off. And, and this is pretty new territory to me. I'd heard of them, but I'd never dug into them. They are a class of therapeutic anabolic compounds. So let's be clear on both those terms. Therapeutic means these are not performance enhancing drugs and they're anabolic, meaning in some way, shape or form, they're on the building side of the, the, the build tear down uh, equation. So the <clears throat> acronym itself, SARM stands for selective androgen receptor modulator. So each of those terms, selective, uh, whereas anabolic steroids are seen more as a blunt tool and that they target all sorts of, speci- uh, all sorts of uh, muscle, or not muscle tissue, but all sorts of tissue. These are selective in that they target more specific tissue, in particular bone and muscle. Androgen, they are producing male characteristics. Flip side of that would be estrogen. Uh, but because these are selective, they only target certain tissues. Again, that bone and muscle. So male characteristics in bone and muscle. So we're talking about greater lean lean mass, greater bone density. Receptor, Uh, think in terms, anytime you hear receptor, think in terms of receptors and ligands. So a receptor is uh, kind of of a a cup, whereas a ligand would be a ball that fits in that cup, right? So in the case of testosterone, which is a naturally, naturally produced androgenic ligand, it's also artificially produced, but let's just talk about the natural version of it. Testosterone bonds to is the ligand that bonds to a particular receptor and then particular things take place, you know, more muscle mass, et cetera. And this is kind of similar to when we talked about caffeine and adenosine way back Mm -hmm. in the day where you have adenosine receptors and over the course of the day, adenosine accumulates and you get drowsy, but caffeine can also fit those receptors. Caffeine is a ligand that is similar in shape, fits those receptors and blocks the adenosine accumulation and you don't get drowsy. And it's also a naturally occurring ligand. So SARMs are a synthetic version of this. So they're a synthetic androgen receptor ligand. And then as far as the M, that's modulator. It's just some form of control or influence, in this case, over bone and muscle. So to sum all that up, SARMs modulate the growth of bone and muscle by binding to specific growth-oriented receptors. Okay, make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so purportedly, they convey endurance and recovery properties. And this may or may not be true. Frankly, I don't think it matters. Reason being, this is an investigational drug, and that means that doctors cannot prescribe it. And if you want to take it and compete, you have to get a temporary use exemption, a TUE from WADA, just to be part of a controlled trial that may be looking at this this influence on anything really. It's Mm. under investigation as a means to thwart particular things, all related to muscle wasting. So whether it's heart failure, cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, end stage uh, renal failure, end stage liver failure, HIV, anything that's severe and chronic, they're kind of throwing this at it and seeing if it sticks. It has been noted that there is therapeutic promise when it comes to Alzheimer's and uh, muscular dystrophy, uh, breast and prostate cancer, osteoporosis, list goes on, but it doesn't change the fact that this is an unregulated drug. It's not FDA approved, it's not WADA approved, and therefore it's not USADA legal. And that goes for in competition or out of competition, all levels of competition, whether you're recreational all the way up to world and Olympic level. It is not approved for human consumption. Translation, this stuff is not safe. Um, In 2017, the FDA issued a public advisory warning of increased risk of heart attack, stroke, and liver damage. So I almost feel whoever our anonymous is, is, he's almost trolling us because when I looked this up and when a few of us looked this up right away, we saw this again and again and again, heart attack, stroke, liver, yeah. and, and just about everything I came across. This drug has been researched for over 20 years and it still has not gained FDA approval. So I say again, it is not safe. If this isn't enough to stop you from considering using this, say it with me, testicular shrinkage. This affects your <laughs> testosterone level. If that doesn't freak you out, how about long-term effects are unknown? We still don't know after 20 years what this can do down the road. Yeah. On top of it, if you decide to undergo this form of, I don't want to say treatment, but you then have to cycle in the estrogen component of it, the, the CIRMS side. So you're bouncing mm-hmm. back before these two things. And there are all sorts of horror stories too, depending on who you want to believe. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> that's rough, man. Okay. Yeah. So so that's that's kind of the, the science on it, a little bit of judgment in there, but now I'm going to dive fully into the judgment (laughs) side of things and hop up on my soapbox and just talk about the the dangers of pills, anything that's easily ingested. And I want to make it clear that pill form doesn't remove or diminish the risks. It just doesn't. It seems so innocuous that we can pop a little pill. Whereas 
you know, you think of steroids and you think of mainlining them. Well, there's, there's pill forms of all these things. It doesn't make them some, somehow safe or risk-free. And even if it did, what about the moral, ethical, philosophical considerations? I mean, frankly, I can't even get to the legality of issues like these because I get hung up on the, the aforementioned. This mm -hmm. whole magical pill phenomenon, anything that promises rapid weight loss or extra energy or better sleep at night, makes you faster, makes you stronger. All these things come with consequences. Nothing's ever for free and nothing worth achieving comes easily. Yeah. So my personal yeah. take on this is that any training or nutritional modification should facilitate, but never replace hard work. You got to do the work. There are no magic pills. Hard agree. <laughs> <laughs> Preach coach, hey, Dad. <laughs> hey, did you have something on this? Sorry, the screen broke up, and I didn't know if you were trying to jump in or yeah, not. Sir. There is a delay on Zoom, and it's ruining our mojo today, so I apologize. <laughs> I think we should have some Stuff. beers, Chad. If I could go run to the uh, kitchen and deliver them outside your door, then you yeah, could pick all... them up, and we could get this podcast rolling. It's all like fat tire and stuff like that. Okay, yeah. It's a good idea. In though. general, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've watched a lot of uh, documentaries about steroids because I find them very uh, interesting. And I said this joke to you guys, but you can all tell I don't do steroids. Like, there's <laughs> nothing about me that does it. So just because I know about them does not mean uh, I've done them. And I actually have had a lot of friends, especially in college, who've done steroids. And uh, actually taking pill form of steroids is harder on you. I believe it's because of uh, your liver than injecting them. So uh, it's a, like just your point, Chad, that pills are pill that means nothing right like it's better and there's a lot of uh, drugs too that are regular pharmaceuticals that they inject rather than a pill because of various reasons of absorption or safety so don't there's no like blanket statement either way that is one is better than the other and uh mm -hmm. i don't do we, do we have our you want to do more judgment on on this or do you want yeah. my judgment too <laughs> you go ahead nate you jump in I would never take these. This is scary, so scary to me. Yeah. Like the the risks are incredibly high. And uh, if you're gonna dope and do this, do the stuff that's like, like I don't wanna say dope because this is a, okay. If you're this, not we'll just jump to it. Right? This is a whole nother phys, uh, phil, phys, philosophical. What, how do you say that? I can't. It's a <laughs> <world> today. <laughs> philosophical. That's it. John yes, said it. That's exactly it. Yep, um, you got this. <laughs> I got this. Okay, this is hard. Uh, this is the whole thing. I personally, this is personal stuff. I don't care if you smoke weed, if you do drugs or drink, and it's not impacting anyone else, not impacting your family, you're not drinking and driving, you're at your house. If you want to get jacked on testosterone and steroids, I personally don't care. What I don't want to do is I don't want to race against you. I don't want you in sports competition, that sort of thing. Um, and I don't want any side effects affecting other people. If like in, in Oregon now in the US, what they can do mushrooms, right? Like by mm -hmm. themselves in their house and not be uh, and not be illegal. I don't personally have a problem with that. I've never done any illegal drugs like that. Uh, so I don't, I, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't wanna do it. I don't want my kids to do it. But if you do you, I don't care. But if you're gonna, so that's what I'm saying, if you're gonna do this stuff, and you're like, I want to get jacked for some reason. My personal way that I personally would do it is I would go to one of those, like a doctor, a TRT doctor that have helped a lot of people. We actually just had somebody on the um, the podcast who had, uh, um, uh, what was it, John? I forget. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, so that was the episode with Jamie Berry, and he had experienced reds. So he was on specific medication because of how far he had been driven down and the damage that was done to his body as a result of, of living with and just keep continuing to drive himself down into a hole with reds. So, yeah. And, nice. and it's, it, and it's, it's absolutely um, like, there's a place for it. Right. Like, and, and it's needed in some cases, the competition aspect is so tough to me though. And, and here's the other thing. If you're a cyclist or triathlete listening to this, and, he, and you'd say that I'm going to take this stuff and I'm not going to compete and it's not the plan. How as a competitive person, will you not be tempted once you're getting jacked and super fast, even though SARMs are clearly, it sounds like not the way to, to go about this, <laughs> but just with whatever you're doing, how are you then not going to be able to say, man, I'm so much faster right now. I'll just not compete against a single person. You're a competitive person. Like you, you have to, I, I don't buy the argument of athletes that say, oh, I'm not going to race or I'm not going to compete for this period of time. So I can do whatever I want. And I'd still will ride my bike. I still do, will do all that stuff. You're going to be so tempted to jump in to some sort of a race and to do that. And not to mention the fact that there are long-term 
effects from these things, negative, sure, yeah. but also positive. They can stick around. Well, that's what I want to say is with TRT specifically for men, I am interested in that. I'm 38, uh, but I, I would not do it right now based on the research there is because there's too much unknowns and too much risk factors for me of stroke, heart attack, like having a stroke when you're 50 or 60, oh, you could have 40 more years of life, right? And then you're kind of, your whole cognitive function is down. Uh, and you, you can see where mine is right now with speaking and you can imagine if I had a stroke, <laughs> it would be really, really bad. So, uh, but I think maybe when I'm 70, 80, hopefully there's another 30, 40 years of research around it. And if by then there is measurable, like there's good science that, Hey, this improves life, extends life without downsides. I would be fine doing that. I wouldn't race. Um, but that's, that's just me. And someone's going to probably say, Nate endorses doping. I totally don't, uh, I, like there's a difference and I hope people understand that. But I think on this podcast, people have other opinions, uh, mm -hmm. than me and I'd love to hear them. <laughs> you will. I'm coming from, you know, I spent 12 years in the pro Peloton and, in testing pools. And frankly, like I shied away from even a lot of just regular vitamin supplements because I was so terrified of contamination as a clean athlete. The idea that you might accidentally ingest something is seriously terrifying. And I'm very proud to be able to say that I spent 12 years racing professionally and never took any performance enhancing drugs. And I really, truly, that matters. That matters a lot. Um, it matters to me personally. And I, I do think that it matters in the bigger picture. And so I am coming at this with that bias. And I understand that this person wasn't suggesting taking this and competing on it, but even so I just, I, I personally have a really hard time with hack culture. It's so problematic. I mean, if taking a pill could result in the same gains as exercise and weightlifting only faster and with no, no side effects, this would be publicly, repeatedly, and universally recommended. I mean, here's the thing. You know what is publicly, repeatedly, and universally recommended? Exercise. <laughs> drinking a diet. lot of water and hydrating, <laughs> <laughs> eating vegetables. These are the things that we know work. And these are the things that we know don't have those side effects. The idea that there's going to be some secret thing that nobody's known about yet. No, like if there were a magic bullet, we would know, we would definitely know. And in, and I mean, we would have heard of it. It would be widely available, widely recommended. And this just, this is not one of those things. So I, I, mm. Yeah, I'm I'm 100% with Chad on that one for sure. This is just this is a bad idea for so many reasons whether or not you plan to race. Can I tie this back into Sarms on one specific point that you made that I thought was great Amber of contaminated supplements and who knows what's in them. Mm. In particular with with Sarms uh, in this case, Jesse actually one of our great copywriters which if you haven't looked at our blog, you absolutely should. Jesse, Sean and Megan are always putting out incredible content on there. And, uh, Jesse actually, uh, he, so there's a link and it's actually linked in the, if you look at the description below for this podcast and for the YouTube video and in the forum, you can find links to everything here. This is from uspharmacist.com. And, um, basically this is a report on SARMs among the 44 products marketed and sold as SARMs that were tested. So they grabbed a bunch of these products and they tested them to see what was actually in them. Only 52% of these products actually contained one or more SARMs. 39% of the products contained other unapproved drugs. No active compound was detected in 9% of the compounds. Substances not listed on the label were contained in 25%. The amount of active compound in the product matched that listed on the label in only 41% of the product. And the amount of the compounds listed on the label differed substantially from that found by analysis in 59% of them. So this is another uh, thing to keep in mind with everything that you're taking. If you go to even uh, what seems like a reputable store where there are big brands and products that are on the shelf, that sort of a thing, it's always really tricky. Like you, you don't know whether it's cross-contamination from an assembly line. You don't know if they change suppliers and as a result, it's less reliable. There's so many different things. And that's why you hear a lot about athletes in all sports because of tainted supplements getting popped for doping and, and having these unexpected things come up and entirely ruin their careers. So it, it is like, Amber, you are smart in, in doing that. There's reason to have that sort of fear as an athlete that you, something might get in there. Yeah. Nate, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, first one correction, Lisa, correct me. Thank you in the chat. Uh, mushrooms are illegal only under medical supervision and in person medical supervision, uh, in Portland. But so that there's a, they're trying to figure out if it's medically like viable for certain 
sure. issues. I don't want to say anything else because I don't fully understand it. Uh, the next <laughs> thing, just what you just said, uh, when I so if we do this Paralympic stuff, we'll absolutely get tested. And just to Amber's point, like I'm looking here, I have some fish oil, I have a B12. Like these aren't the certified, uh, sci like the NSF what are they called? Certified. The NSF yeah. certified. Yeah. There's, yeah. Yep. And so you can take those kind of things and it's less likely to be contaminated, but it's still not promised. Right. Risk. And I think Amber, and we don't want to name any brands, but you know, people that took stuff that probably all of us have taken before brand and we've got, they've mm -hmm. gotten popped and they like proved that it was in that substance. Right. Is that true? Right. Yeah, no, there, it, it definitely happens where accidental ingestion is, is the case, but at the end of the day, the thing that gets just absolutely pounded into your head from day one is you are 100 risk percent responsible for everything you put in your body. So if you don't do the homework to figure out whether or not this is contaminated, which let's be honest, that's not always possible. You are still responsible for making the decision to put it in your mouth. Like that's mm -hmm. just how it is. And, and I took that responsibility so seriously. And I just, I, I, yeah, there's, <laughs> mm. I could go on about this for hours, but, but I won't, yeah. but I feel so strongly about this. This, this is that point of asymmetric risk. Once again, well, it's a recurring theme. Like yeah. what's the upside and what's the potential downside as well? Like the potential downside is just so great. You don't know yeah. what could be in those supplements. It's not worth it. And, right. and we've talked about this before, but and I'm sure you saw this, Amber. Um, a tainted supplement may not have been intentional dopamine. It may not have even enhance performance in any sort of substantial way, but there is no way that you'll ever be able to remove an asterisk by your name thereafter. If nope. you're an amateur or you're a professional, it will always call every single one of your achievements into question. A hundred percent. It's just mm -hmm. not worth it. It's too risky. No, I mean, I, I didn't even take over the counter cold medication, which mm -hmm. believe me, like you get sick as an athlete, it sucks. And you, you, you just have to suffer through it because almost every over the counter cold medication has some form of banned substance. I, you know, and some of those substances are only banned in competition, not necessarily banned out of competition, but I'm still not going to touch those. Cause I don't want to even have the risk that one of those remains in my, in my system, you know, come mm -hmm. race day a few weeks later. It's just, it's not worth the risk. Like you said, it's that asymmetric risk. It's not worth it. And it's not necessary. I think one of the things that's probably pretty clear to anybody who's listening to this podcast is for me, sp sport and cycling is so much more than just pedaling, right? It's an avenue for self-improvement and self-discovery that goes well beyond any kind of power output and much further beyond any kind of a race outcome. And that piece of personal development, self-discovery that is really one of the pieces is really important to me is integrity. And to give that up for what a race result. I mean, to me the it's, it's not, it, it's not worth it. Like there's nothing that makes that worth it because the race for the, what makes the race result meaningful is all of the work and the sacrifice and the ups and downs and the lessons learned that go into it. That's what makes it meaningful. And you take that meaningful piece out the second that you put something in your body to cheat. And, and again, I know that that's not necessarily what this question is about, but that asymmetric risk is, is grossly asymmetric for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so Chad, with all the information that you shared there, <clears throat> they're an experimental. We don't know enough about them. What we do seem to know seems pretty bad <laughs> and not good for us. And then on top of that, there's the ethics of the whole thing. There's the, there and, and everything else that lies around this. Um, hopefully this is a good discussion because there's, uh, I know a lot of athletes and here's like a really tricky one. We talked about, reputation with bike fitters. And this is kind of a, a lot of the time I've seen or heard of athletes riding on an existing reputation of a rider. And then that rider is having them do questionable things, rider, team, coach, whatever it may be. And there are athletes that find themselves in a situation. You may find yourself in this situation where you feel like you're starting to, you you meet this rider and then you find out, oh, wow, this rider does this sort of a thing. And that's normal. And I know that this probably sounds like the same sort of discussion that you had in like drug awareness uh, when you were a kid in school, but it's the same thing. Uh, if you know it's wrong, just because somebody else does it doesn't mean that it's right. And when we're talking about sport in, in particular, it's just something we have to be careful with. So uh, yeah, anyways, um, hopefully that, that covers it. Is there anything else uh, that we want to cover on this one before we move on to Doug's question? Do the work. It's worth cool. it. Cool. Yes. Amen. Integrity is why cycling is so great painful. It's, it's embarrassing at times 
And then it's so rewarding when you have done the work and you're there. Nothing compares with that. You know, it's so great. So, okay. Doug says coaches, uh, pod, the podcast continue to be tremendous and I'm spreading the word. The water bottle question on episode 282 was hilarious. I'm glad we're solving the world's <laughs> problems. It says, uh, my question, some experts have stated that inflammation induced from exercise is the primary signal for the body to maximize adaptation processes. I'm going to recap that in a different way, but basically what he's saying there is that you exercise inflammation happens. And as a result of the inflammation, you get faster. That's more or less the, the what, what's being communicated there. If we try to reduce inflammation through questionable recovery methods, such as ice baths, stretching, foam rolling. And I think that he says questionable because the science isn't, it's really hard for science to actually bear out any sort of performance improvement as a result of these methodologies. That's if you really dig into the science, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that. Um, there's also a whole lot of marketing hype that goes to the other side of things, but, uh, foam rolling, massage, compression boots, et cetera. If we do all of that, we reduce the signal, the inflammation he's talking about and may limit adaptation. So if we use recovery methods mentioned above, we lower inflammation and speed up recovery time. Both strategies have their places. But number one, is there science behind this? And number two, if so, is there an inflammation window? Meaning if I complete my hard ride by 11 a.m., how many hours should I wait before sliding into my boots for sweet, sweet compression? <laughs> Thanks uh, from Doug. And I agree. I have compression boots. I have no clue if they make me faster, but they feel really nice. Um, <laughs> foam rolling too. I don't know if it makes me faster, but it's a great way to get really effective massage. Like there are a lot of these things we're going to have a discussion on inflammation, but I kind of want to separate that a bit, Chad, from the actual methodologies that he was talking about there mm -hmm. because yeah, things get really general. muddy. Yeah. Yep. So mm -hmm. yep. let's go into it. Yeah. Okay. So let's um, give short answers to both those questions. Is there science behind this? Yeah. It's, it's just not as conclusive as any of us would like it to be. And that means there is not really an inflammation window there. There's, there's a lot of learnings to be taken from what I'm about to share with you. Amber and I are going to tab, tag team this, but there's, there's no quick, easy answer. I'll just let you off the hook right now, but let's talk about a lot of things because there is a lot to be learned here and a lot to actually apply. And the science is still ongoing or the researchers are still hard at it. So first off, um, let's talk about what inflammation is, whether it's chronic or acute, you know, you know, long, long occurring at, at a low level or, you know, much more severe, like for instance, a high ankle sprain, this is an immune mediated reaction. So the immune system is responsible for initiating this. It's, it's, an, it, it, it plays a pivotal role in this to infection or tissue damage, which is, it's a necessary part of the whole reparative process or in the parlance of our endurance sport adaptive process. So anytime you see repair, just equate it to adaptation. So we don't really deal with infection here, or that's not really what we're talking about today. So let's look at tissue damage. And when it comes to tissue damage in cycling, now cycling is a non-impact sport and our contractions are largely concentric, meaning that, that we're, we're contracting the muscle as it's getting shorter. So because of that, there's less mechanical stress. You go on the opposite side of that, you get eccentric contractions. That's when the muscle's getting longer. That's when a lot of muscle damage occurs. It also lays the foundation for what could be a lot of strength improvements, <clears throat> but that's not really where we go. Our primary stressor is oxidative stress. But the thing is, and I struggled with this over the course of the research here is that those two things go so hand in hand that they're almost inextricable. So, so if I veer over the course of this explanation from inflammation back to, to uh, oxidative stress, please forgive me, but just know for our intents today, they're, they're basically the same thing. So cycling stress is, is more metabolic. It's more tied to energy supply and, and energy depletion than mechanical or muscle damage. Like if you're lifting weights or, or running downhill, that sort of thing. But again, there's a lot of overlap. You affect one, you're going to touch on the other and vice versa. Right. So it's the difference between the mechanical and kind of the chemical stress is, is mm -hmm. what we're looking at with the exactly. oxidative stress. And as a quick review, like for everybody listening, some of you are probably already aware of this, but just to help with some context, um, oxidative stress kind of goes back to those terms, oxidize versus reduce. So if you oxidize a molecule, it gives up an electron and it therefore increases, it becomes a positive charge if it was neutral to begin with. And then the reverse of that is if you add an electron to a molecule that had had a neutral charge, it becomes negatively charged and that's to reduce the mo molecule reduction. And these are sort of like what we call redox equations, redox reactions, um, in, in the chemistry that's happening in the body. And, and it, part of this that's really relevant here, there's a lot of different pathways that can cause 
produce oxidative stress, but one of the main ones is in ATP production. So ATP is a molecule that's sort of the universal energy currency of, of the body and that gets produced in our mitochondria. And the way that that gets produced is in part through what's called an electron transport chain. And that's exactly what it sounds like. An electron is bouncing down this chain of molecules. And the final acceptor of that electron is oxygen. And usually what happens is when that oxygen becomes reduced because we're adding that electron, it's accepting that final elect or it's the final acceptor of the electron. We, um, it usually produces water, but some small percentage of cases as that's happening, and it's happening, it's happening a lot in every little mitochondria in our cells, some small percentage of those, uh, it, instead of producing water, it produces superoxides or O2 minus. So it's basically an oxygen molecule with an extra electron dangling on it. And those superoxides are uh, radical or sorry, reactive oxygen species that Chad's going to talk about more. But that's just sort of to give you some context of like one example of where this might be happening in the body and why this is so strongly associated with endurance training and exercise. I felt like I just went yeah, back into like chemistry class. <laughs> <laughs> those electrons though, those little dangling electrons are like little fires. So think of them in yeah. terms of that. They, they have the capacity to, to destroy. I just started. Okay. So. <laughs> oh man. Go ahead. Yeah, those, those people, those super good people love the science. People love it. Oh yeah. How can we yeah. make electrons more exciting for you, Nate? <laughs> I need like a little ball, like a big ball with like electrons, like yes. uh, styrofoam, like, stick them. to it. Two take them off. Yes. yes. Pond Academy. <laughs> Rice Krispie is. balls. They do that well. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> now let's move on to um, what's a 10,000 foot review. See what I did there? Not, not 10,000 foot view. We're going to go over something we good, covered Jeff. in a previous podcast. <laughs> so let's look at the 10,000 foot view of the immune response or the inflammatory response. So basically an injury or an illness or some form of stress occurs, there's a release of cytokines. And these are signaling molecules that you know, effectively orchestrate this entire immune response. We're going to come back to them. So, so kind of put a pin in that. Um, the blood brings in very specific cells. Amongst them are uh, white blood cells or leukocytes, specifically neutrophils. These seem to be the first on the scene. They neutralize the threat. They die, a process called apoptosis. They get cleaned up, a process called macrophagy by, you know, macrophagy or phagocytosis, whatever terms aren't important. That the, These macrophages clean them up and then the waste is shuttled into the lymph system. Everything goes back to normal. So ideally there's a state of inflammation. It's followed by anti-inflammation and, and a return to homeostasis. And this term comes up a lot if you start to delve into this topic, resolution of inflammation. That's what we're looking for. But homeostasis requires tissue repair and the reestablishment of functionality. And it's the macrophages that orchestrate this entire reparative process. So to sum up so far, we're talking about neutrophils and macrophages. They are the key inflammation players. There are many others. But those are the two we're going to target today. <clears throat> So one of the problems is that there's an overabundance of these same cells can actually cause collateral damage and it can impede or blunt the healing process. It, in our terms, again, it can blunt adaptation. So the, the neutrophil specifically, their mission is to remove the remnants of damage. And one of the ways they do it, or one of the, uh, they do a number of things, but one thing that happens is that they release reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species in a process called respiratory burst. And this is the oxidative stress that Amber just described in detail. So all these cells, the neutrocytes, the, the macrophages, the lymphocytes, they all have the ability to produce free radicals, also known as oxidants. These are the, the, the key players in oxidative stress, right? And those neutrophils specifically, in one of the papers, it, they were referred to as both perpetrator of tissue damage and initiator of repair. They're on both sides of that coin. So the takeaway here is that there exists a balance point between inflammation and anti-inflammation. But one thing before you jump in, Amber, just got to mm -hmm. say, I'm going to someday have an enduro bro <clears throat> team and they're going to be called the free radicals. That's the perfect name <laughs> for an enduro bro team. <laughs> Sorry, totally unimportant. Carry on Amber with the next point that you have. <laughs> oh no, no. I was just going to jump in and say like, this is so cool. Imagine that the body has a solution, right? It's just, it's, it's a built in balance. So smart. Yeah, and we're going to see a lot of examples of that. That's an important point though, that you bring up Amber. Like I know it, that it's like, you know, a bit tongue in cheek there and everything else, but we so many times feel like we need to be the ones through outside influence to be able to, to decide when these processes happen and influence them and adjust them because our bodies just simply don't know what they should be doing or we know better. Right. But our body has 
mechanisms built in to be able to manage these sort of things. Sure. Sometimes they get out of whack for one reason or another, but it is important to remember that there are a lot of automated processes in the body and it's not entirely up to you to foam roll and take in something different to be able to in- entirely influence a state of inflammation within the body. There's mm-hmm. a system in place for it. So mm-hmm. that's a point. profound point that you make there, Amber. Okay. So to, to sprinkle just a little bit of further complexity on top of something that is tremendously complex to start with, part of what regulates the neutrophil death and removal. So remember they come in and then they have to die off. Part of what regulates that process are reactive oxygen species. So oxidative stress in this case is actually our friend. It it kills neutrophils. The dead bodies of those neutrophils actually dissuade the arrival of more. So it shuts down what is probably the, 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 the beginning of that immune process for the, by the, what would that be the innate system? So the takeaway there is that antioxidants delivered at the wrong time can actually increase our inflammatory timeline. So we're effectively making antioxidants pro-inflammatory. So again, get out of the way. So when it, when it comes to <laughs> inflammation, the old aim was to balance the infl- inflammatory response with an anti-inflammatory one. The newer aim is to incite that term I used earlier, resolution of inflammation, not simply tamp it down. Put another way, we want to balance the pro-inflammatory response with a regenerative one. So we want to balance damage with repair. We don't simply want to fight inflammation. And then the newish science, and I say newish because this is, I, I looked at papers that were 10 years old that were talking about this. The, the pro-inflammatory factors activate what are called pro-resolving factors. So inflammation actually fosters its own resolution. That's really cool. Again, body's super smart. And I <laughs> just to uh, harken back to the previous discussion, this is a really good example of we're trying to hack our biology. Um, doesn't really work that well. And then, oh, yeah. hey, with some more information, we discover that our biology actually had it handled in the first place. <laughs> yep. And there are certain things we can do to facilitate it. And, and we'll get to those yeah. too. But they're not as complex as something like SARMs. So <laughs> now let, let's take a look at, uh, let's apply this to you know me personally, my ankle sprain, which by the way, I'm doing totally great. Um, surgery's fully off the table. That was, that was an acute injury. Right. And that, that brought with it acute inflammation, but I faced the same challenge. It's like, how do I balance the inflammatory response with these pro resolving or healing factors? You know, when is swelling good versus bad? And that's the rub, right? The, the removal of these pro inflammatory factors or the removal of inflammation actually removes the signals to these pro resolution factors to the repair. And in doing so it impedes that repair process, or in our cases, our performance adaptation. And, and so while briefly, while we're on the topic of signaling, let's talk about those cytokines that I mentioned earlier. Translation, they're, they're molecular messengers. For our purposes, that's, that's all the more specific we need to get. And I bring this up for a couple of reasons, but one of which is I'm sure you've heard the term cytokine storm, which is a response, a severe response to COVID. It's basically a hyper-inflammatory response to the coronavirus that results in this severe respiratory distress. And it's effectively a storm of signals that result in fi- hyper-inflammation, sorry. Within the muscle, we have cytokines. They're called myokines. And, and, and th- this is how signals take place via the muscles and they're actually contraction regulated. So through muscle contraction, we emit these myokines, these little chemical messengers that tell our bodies different things. So exercise, and this includes endurance exercise, induces this release. And, and one paper said that local and systemic cytokine production in response to physical exercise resembles the cytokine response to infections and trauma, et cetera. It actually got a little scary down the line there. But the takeaway <laughs> is, is that, that we inflict trauma on our bodies and our muscles, and then we interrupt the repair process through these different mm. you know, recovery modalities. Mm-hmm. But again, the question is, you know, when to intervene? These, these do have their place. We just can't put a specific time on when they should happen. Um, myokine release actually further is actually furthered by heat. And, you know, we're talking external heat in the environment, but what does that translate to? But internal heat or elevations in core temperature, same thing happens with intensity. Paradoxically, when it comes to intensity, higher intensity is actually linked to higher anti-inflammatory cytokine release. So in this case, it's a suppression of the immune response. Once again, our bodies are already on the case. Mm-hmm. So the takeaway here is again, let the natural processes take place undisturbed. But that brings us to the million dollar question. How long? And that's that how window. Long we, that... How long do we not interrupt it? Yeah. Yeah. One is this inflammatory window. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's a science behind inflammation and, and a bit on oxidation. So now let's relate all this to exercise stress. So exercise induced muscle damage and oxidative stress. Specifically, that's what we're talking about. 
Cycling doesn't typically cause a high level of muscular damage. So this EIM, EIMD, exercise-induced muscle damage, it's not really what we're talking about here. Through intensity, through long duration, which is effectively long, uh, continuous contractions, just over and over and over and over again, through rapid contractions, we can, as endurance athletes, amplify the what's, called, what's termed the magnitude of the exercise stimulus. So we can accomplish fiber damage, but more likely it's oxidative stress. That's what we're mostly concerned about. Mm -hmm. And this is appropriate because one of the many papers I, I covered says that oxidative stress is the key driver in aerobic and anaerobic adaptation. And this is not like a, a one-off paper. This is a, this is a known thing, but this paper by uh, Margaret Tellis, 2017, all this stuff is linked, used an in vivo approach to study the role of reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. So these signaling molecules now in vivo, as opposed to, <clears throat> excuse me, in vitro, where, you know, we're outside of the body, like in a Petri dish sort of thing, or in situ where we're looking more specifically at a tissue. We're not looking at what they looked at, which is a far more integrative, holistic view of what's going on. And they observed all the way to performance measures, all the way down to what's going on in the cell, the redox reactions we talked about earlier. So in terms of the performance measure, they looked at VO2 max, which was a good measure of aerobic fitness, a Wingate test, which is a good measure of anaerobic capacity, and then time trial performance, which is not only a really good measure of performance itself, but it also combines aerobic and anaerobic uh, energy systems really nicely. And they reported that, quote, classical adaptations to endurance training are at least in part regulated by the degree of exercise induced oxidative stress. So again, it, for us, it's really about that oxidative stress, not only, but, but largely. What was especially uh, what stood out about this study was that they recognized the subjectivity of both the antioxidant response and the adaptive effects that take place subsequently, right? So what was interesting is that the group with the lowest level of oxidative stress, they all did the same workout, but this group exhibited the lowest oxidative stress response. These guys, <clears throat> sorry, I totally lost my place. <laughs> Oh, they, because of this lowest oxidative stress, lowest stimulus, they saw the lowest level of adaptations. They didn't get the response necessary or the response they were targeting. What was even more interesting is that the mid and high level groups, they saw the most oxidative stress. They saw the same degree of adaptation. So I have three observations here. And actually the scientists had three observations and I chime in somewhere in there. First off, we just need to reach a certain oxidative stress threshold. Does this ring any bells? I mean, this is minimal effective dose. I mean, mm -hmm. low response didn't net me. anything. Moderate response did net something. High response, oxidative stress response didn't net any more than the moderate. So why would we push ourselves into further oxidative stress when all we really need to do is go this far? Mm -hmm. Secondly, and sadly, it kind of lends support to the whole re responders debate that some people are in fact low responders. That's unfortunate. You know, they did the same work yet they elicited less or accrued, incurred less oxidative stress and therefore subsequently less physiologic adaptation. Well, bummer for them. Same conclusion though, train more. You, you need a heart, a higher stimulus for, for whatever reason you need to do more. Sorry. Okay. And then <clears throat> finally mechanism doesn't ensure outcome. So it, it, if you want to look at this all scientifically and mechanistically, more oxidative stress should elicit a greater adaptive stimulus should create a, a greater physical level of physical adaptation should yield better performance. But there's a lot that goes on between what initially incites all this and, 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 the, and the performance outcome. And I mentioned this because recently Amber pointed out a series of three tweets from Inigo Samalon who applied this very same idea to PGC-1 alpha. The idea mm -hmm. that we can starve yeah. ourselves and get an uptick in this particular biological marker, this uh, co, co, co factor. And then because of that, we're going to see more mitochondria production, which should lead to greater aerobic capacity, which should lead to a higher FTP, which should lead to better performance capabilities. But so much goes on between the initial signaling and those actual performance capacities. So just because we understand it at a low level doesn't mean that what we want to happen is a foregone conclusion. This right. is the marketer's plight, right? Like they get a mm -hmm. hold of some sort of mechanism that's defined through a study and then they productize it. And then it's like, well, it works at this level. So it has to have the implications in terms of performance in your, in the outcome. <laughs> Nate's, Nate's yeah. feeling this one deep inside his bones. Yeah. I can see. <laughs> yeah. And there's, no, and I've I mean, fallen this, prey to this too many times. 
Mm. Oh, we all have. Right. And, and, yeah. and that's the thing, like, that's why marketers are effective, right. And taking something and they'll take this mechanism that exists within our body and then extrapolate it unduly to where it shouldn't be. And that that's a really common thing. And it's something that all of us have to put ourselves in check with. And then we have to use performance as a measurement tool of these sort of things. Like yeah, but see, it's, that's, the, that's it, the tough part to it. For, for sure. I, I completely agree, but it's not even limited to marketers and from marketers, you kind mm -hmm. of expect it, right? They're trying to sell that's something right. from researchers. However, they're just excited about their discovery. So they tell you something and of course you want to believe it. All I have to do is starve myself and I'll get faster. Oh, I can do that. But, <laughs> but it's, it's not that simple and they're not implying right. that it is, but that's what we take from it. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's, it's a good point. It's very tempting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's another magic pill of sorts. Like you mentioned, right? Amber, that's yeah, no, magic is. pills sell. So that's yeah. what they end up going toward, whether it's just an idea or a product. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, so let me wrap this up with a couple of miscellaneous points. Um, first off, regular aerobic exercise actually reduces our sensitivity to these inflammatory signals. So put, put another way, as we adapt, exercise becomes less of a threat to our homeostatic uh, position because we become better equipped, uh, better equipped to handle oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> just had a <laughs> moment there, but I was just going to say, I, this one, <laughs> um, this makes, this makes me really curious and I'm not making this claim. Let me be clear, but it just, you know, this is where my brain goes. It would be really interesting to know if those adaptations also apply to exogenous sources of reactive oxygen species. So wouldn't it be cool if exercising actually had a protective effect against like environmental pollutants and radiation, that would be pretty wild to find out. I think that would just be a really interesting question to answer. It, it makes sense that it would. I, I it logically for so. sure therein lies the danger any sort of logic yeah, yeah. that we no, make right it's just another <laughs> hypothesis that we can pile on to the, the growing right. list of hypotheses so, um, please test so this. <laughs> secondly reactive oxygen and nitrogen species actually play their own roles in re re regulating their own defense so these pro-oxidants actually promote the very antioxidants that balance them out again another indication of the body is is, is on the job more oxidative stress yields greater antioxidant response but mm -hmm. and this is a big but heavy training loads, and I know this is relative, you know, what, what's heavy for me right now is not heavy for Nate. What Nate's doing right now would, would crush me. So heavy training loads, <laughs> subjective, <laughs> relative to the, to the athlete, necessitate a number of things. One of them is greater nutritional support. And I linked to a support, uh, I linked to a support, I linked to an article, uh, a study that's, that's circulating right now. And honestly, if you're at all interested in sport nutrition, whether it's from the strength side or the endurance side, everyone needs to read it. It's called uh, nutrient time in a garage door of opportunity question mark. It's mm -hmm. written by, um, Sean Arndt. And I think the PI, the pr primary investigator on it is Michelle Arndt. And then there's a number of other researchers in there, but man, I'd link to it for a reason. Everyone should read it. If this is at all yeah. interesting to you, it is a concise consolidation of so much research. It's really well it's put so together. Good. I think you yeah, read one of that last week, didn't you, Amber? Yeah, that was one of the sources for last week's discussion about oh, the recovery awesome. drinks. Yeah. yeah. There Super you go. Good. Yep. A lot, of, yeah. a lot of good information in there. Okay. So what else does a heavy training load, relatively heavy training load necessitate, but higher dedication to your recovery, obviously. Mm -hmm. And lastly, better attention to the balance between adaptation and overreaching. I mean, you really got to keep your finger on that pulse. You got to recognize when you've done too much, you know, also when you're not doing enough, but you have to recognize you know, when what you're doing is too much and you've pushed yourself too far into those overreaching waters. So simply you, you need all around better self-support. Yeah, for sure. And uh, to me, this begs a question that maybe th we should be thinking less in terms of anti-inflammatory therapeutics and supplements and more in terms of giving your body what it needs to build and maintain the systems that already manage these pathways extremely well. Like our bodies exactly. know what they're doing give them what they need to do their thing, get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. And on, on that, on that topic of heavy training, those, you can't just ask your body to do more and expect right. it to happen. You have to furnish the necessary materials so that it can do more. <laughs> that would be that great simple. if it was that simple. <laughs> just, yeah, I mean, it is that simple. <laughs> I mean, there, yeah. there's a lot of complexity <laughs> woven into it, but the idea is quite simple. Okay. All so right. let me wrap this up. Short answer, Doug. And that, that was clearly the long answer is that <laughs> researchers, <laughs> Researchers cannot give hard specifics due to a number of variables. What's the mode of exercise? What is the duration of exercise? What's its intensity? What's the novelty? Is this something you're very familiar with doing? Is this new territory for you? Nutrition, both in it, 
after it, during it, well after it, well before it, et cetera. Your response, are you one of these low responders? Are you one of these high responders? Are you somewhere in between? And your training status, are you off the couch you know, and untrained? Are you moderately trained? Are you elite? Also, and finally, the healing or AKA the adaptive rate differs within the same athlete and between athletes. So it's, it's a really tricky thing. You're not, you're not going to be able to, we're, we're never, I, I think even in a clinical setting, we're not going to be able to figure this out. We're certainly not going to be able to figure anything that we can roll out to the masses. And I say, we, I mean, the researchers mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, so yeah, this is actually something that you, I mean, we've probably all had these questions of like, uh, am I taking in berries in my recovery drink and thusly completely removing the inflama inflammatory effect and causing us problems or foam rolling. Is that causing a problem Nate, you had similar questions to this? Also, I just want to state that, uh, it seems like zoom is having some internet issues. So if we have any sort of decoupling or anything else like that, we apologize. Uh, hopefully it'll, it'll get cleaned up for y'all. Um, but Nate, you had these questions and you actually asked somebody. Yes. So I asked a <clears throat> PhD in exercise metabolism, these exact questions, because I, uh, drink a lot of tart cherry juice and all this sort of stuff. And I, I had some questions. I want to know where the science is from his perspective. So I'm going to go through my four questions and then what he said too. And I didn't ask him, uh, if I could say these. And so I'm just going to keep them anonymous right now. Uh, I'm talking about antioxidants. Does timing impact like, uh, what kind of chat's talking about? Can I take vitamin C 12 hours away from training and not impact adaptations? Okay. Answer that. No idea. But probably you don't want to have high oxidative intake in close proximity to training, giving that antioxidants reduce the oxidative stress and then molecular signaling for adaptations. Okay. So he didn't know. And what I'm thinking about this is for the, uh, collagen specifically for, so for collagen, for us to intake collagen, we need, we need to have some vitamin C with that. The studies that I've read about that, they pair with like 50 milligrams of vitamin C a normal like supplement of vitamin C that you would take would be, uh, 500 milligrams. A thousand is not uncommon. It's actually really hard to get. I couldn't find a pill that has 50 milligrams of vitamin C. So instead of that with collagen, I eat some berries, right? So you, you, you take away the supplement, you get some real food. And so when I have collagen in the morning with my coffee, I eat some berries and hopefully then I absorb it. Second Nate, question. That's actually, I just listened to a podcast from Dana Liss the other day. She was on, I think, uh, Power uh, Fuel to the Pedal. And, and she said basically the same thing. And I think she works with Keith Barr but in that, 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 that ascorbic acid or the vitamin C is actually necessary. But in most cases, it's already on board. You, mm -hmm. Whether or not you supplement with it or not is probably not an issue, especially if you're eating things like berries or anything that contains vitamin C. Amazing. Um, okay. Second one. Is there a sliding scale in the amount? I.e., if I eat blueberries and a spinach sal salad one hour before training, is that the same as a thousand milligrams of vitamin C supplement, uh, and a blueberry supplement And two, uh, this is what this person said. I think you really have to ingest pills to get that high amount of vitamins. My personal view is that fruits are fine where supplements aren't. So again, that's, that's more of still, he's not sure, but that's what he thinks. Um, which I think is interesting. And I, I, what the big thing is, is that, uh, it's really hard to measure oxidative stress and that's why they, it's hard to do studies to find the results of this. Um, mm -hmm. number three, are all oxidants the same? I, I believe the stuff I read was testing vitamin C and vitamin E does drinking tart cherry juice in a recovery shake have the same impact. I'm drinking tart cherry juice right now. And they said, <clears throat> Not really. The evidence indicates if you are deficient in some of the antioxidants, you can take them and benefit from them. On the other hand, if you have enough of them and you take more, then you don't benefit. However, it is very difficult to figure out which ones you are lacking. I think down the line, we will be able to say which ones you should take. So individual recommendations, um, which would be nice, right? To say, Hey, you're deficient in these antioxidants. So take these up to a level that doesn't inhibit, um, aerobic adaptations, but we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the final question, I think that, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I think there is still, there, or there was across these papers, still the shared view that you have to decide what you want to emphasize. Do you want to emphasize adaptation or do you want to emphasize recovery? Because in certain scenarios, I mean, you're only trying to uh, magnify the adaptive effect. So, you know, you're going to veer toward that where in other cases, like a stage race, for instance, where you need quick recovery, hitting those antioxidants promptly after a workout actually makes good sense. Oh, segue. Fourth question. Could high dose antioxidants be a good recovery strategy for a stage race where you don't care about long-term mm -hmm. adaptations, 
just day-to-day -day performance? And uh, their response was, exactly. The strategy I recommend for races, especially stage races, or even in competing weekly, would be to reduce the stress. And here is a lot of, um, and there is a lot of evidence that cherries, for instance, improve re recovery or uh, stress. So on top of that too, I think for stage races, like for Cape Epic, um, ice baths for the legs, uh, high antioxidants, lots of sleep, those all reduce uh, inflammation. And we're mm -hmm. not going to get as fast as we would, but hopefully performance then does not reduce, like long term, we won't get as fast as we would if we didn't take those. But hopefully performance does not reduce day to day. And I will take away some long term adaptations to win our challenge and beat Brandon and Amber and Chad and Pete Cape Epic. in that, yes, in October. <laughs> So awesome. That's, that's, it's going to take for more that. than antioxidants, my friend. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. There we go. There's the trash talking Amber that we've always wanted to have on the podcast. <laughs> yes. I'm going to cut that out and play every morning. It's going to be my alarm clock. <laughs> it takes more than antioxidants. It takes more than antioxidants. It takes more than antioxidants. It's going to wake me up and I will start my day. Thank you. Amber. I'm let's, go into some, <laughs> <laughs> let's go into some rapid fire questions. This one's from Joe. He says potential rapid fire. And we're, strangely, I know that this is the, this is, this isn't the only thing that we're going to, we're going to talk about spit more than this. I apologize everybody. But from Joe, he <laughs> says a uh, potential rapid fire <laughs> for heart rate strap monitors. <laughs> do you guys actually use water to wet the contacts or do you just lick them? Um, everybody that licks say, lick, I, I lick them. I, I do. Chad does. Nate does too. I do not. No. I do not. Let me, let me just make it clear. I don't, I don't lick no. my body. I lick the strap. So a little on my fingers and then on the strap. So I'm not like, eh. wait, not like what? Can you do that you, again? I missed this it. This is why you have to join us on YouTube you can rewind to, see these, <laughs> to see these visuals. That was That's wonderful. That's a quick clip right there. <laughs> yeah. But, hundred, just that. Um, <laughs> Jesse pointed out an interesting thing that I'd never considered is that saliva has electrolyte content, which mm -hmm. could make it better than using water, right? Yeah. Water just cuts <laughs> static, whereas saliva actually yeah. has electric uh, or electrolytes. So then that way, what it does is it conducts the electricity better. So I'm gross. I shouldn't do that. Every time I do it, I'm like, I'm a disgusting person, but then I forget <laughs> about it and I just focus on my workout. <laughs> I don't know if I'm alone in this. If you are in the, in the live chat, commiserate with me. So um, but yeah, that's, that's a, once again, answering the important questions, Mateus says, uh, how should I use? Plant wait, 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 oh. but this, we're, this is going to prevent an email. You can use gel. <laughs> you can buy gel and oh, uh, yeah. put them on your straps. So there's a special kind of gel that you can get so that it does conduct. Yes, we know it, but we're just too lazy. Or you yes. can just work harder in your workout. So you sweat and Cheap. they work as intended. That happens too. <laughs> well. Yeah. Thanks, Amber. <laughs> uh, says, how should I, Mateus says, how should I use plan builder if I don't know if any of my events will actually happen next year? So we're going to use this rapid fire question to rapid fire answer a handful of these questions. We're getting lots of questions because lots of folks are signing up, starting to train for their next year, that sort of a thing. So we're going to answer a handful of those questions. So the, this question, how do I use plan builder if I don't have any uh, events on the actual calendar? Uh, Nate, actually, since Cape Epic just got changed, um, you ended up, uh, changing things around. In other words, plan builder isn't static. It isn't locked in. You can adjust it, right? Yep. You can, uh, so we had to delete Cape Epic and I put a new Cape Epic. You can, uh, delete your plan and redo it, or you can reapply it. There's a whole bunch of options. Actually, Amber's the, the company expert, Amber and Brandon are so, but <laughs> I, I think I got it all right. Is that anything else, Amber? That nailed I it. Good job, Nate. Dang. You nailed yes. it. <laughs> now, if you don't have any events or don't know if your events will happen, then there are two things that you can do. You can either select, I don't have any events. And then what our, mm -hmm. our system will do is train you up until a certain point within a specific, uh, discipline of cycling. So if it's time trials, for example, it will train you as a time trialist would until a specific date and try to build your fitness to help you. It'll optimize to make you reach the highest peak that you could within that time period. Yeah. Right. That's the goal. I I can communicate this better. So what you need to do is you can, uh, you put all your races in and then when these races get canceled, they're going to get canceled, hopefully right before it. And as you delete them, the plan will update, right? Mm -hmm. And the plan builder mm -hmm. will update and that's what we want. So don't, you just pretty much act like you're going to have all these events. And then as they change, your future will change and you'll still be a, a amazing fast athlete. 
Correct. All money and now answer, answering an, an in-between scenario that isn't Mateus's scenario here, if you don't have events, you can still use Plan Builder. And that was, like I said, you just select the discipline that you want to use, or you can always just throw on uh, whatever event you want on the calendar, make it your own event. And just like I did this year with my solo stage race, and you'll still end up getting crazy fit for something. And hey, if that race ends up happening, uh, a real race around that time, then you'll be fit and ready. So that's one there. Um, okay. Uh, next one from Andy says 50 ish. I assume talking about age, long time listener, recent subscriber here. Thanks for signing up. It says mainly a hilly Fondo rider, uh, does the Mallorca, Mallorca 312 and attempt the tour. I've been reading up on the importance of strength and weight training, but really don't want to use traditional gym equipment as I don't want to pay for gym access. And I'm nervous as I'm a bit clumsy and have creaky knees and back. Is there something else I could use to get similar benefits at home? Like a kettlebell, even if only half as effective as a rack bar and plates, my view is something is better than nothing. Cheers from Andy. Uh, Chad, do you want to answer this one? Sure. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> when, it, when it comes to kettlebells, I mean, they are the height of brutal simplicity, but they're hard to work with. I mean, you, you mm -hmm. kind of have to know what you're doing. Not to mention, you kind of have to have a, a bunch of kettlebells. Uh, not one kettlebell is going to work across the board for a bunch of different exercises. So in situations like this, I always lean toward adjustable dumbbells. I did this for myself quite a while and for quite a while, and they work really well. So, I mean, you can get adjustable dumbbells that load all the way up to like hundred plus pounds. I mean, that's 200 pounds in dumbbells at increments of like, I think five pounds typically. So you can do quite a lot with those and pretty much every exercise that's beneficial or necessary can be done with dumbbells as well as it could be done. Maybe not as well, but very similarly to what can be done with mm -hmm. a kettlebell or a barbell or body weight or you know, a machine. It's also worth saying too, Chad, uh, I'll actually, I'll ask you this as the resident jacked dude, who is the expert on strength <laughs> training here. Uh, it's kind of bad for me to say that I'm not so jacked. So, uh, but, uh, Chad, a lot of cyclists could get a lot from strength training without any equipment, which is body weight work. Correct. Like th there's still a yeah. lot of low hanging fruit there even. Yeah. I mean, if you haven't done it before, your body's going to respond to that and you can make body weight exercises really difficult. They're never really going to cultivate the same type of strength that we get when we lift heavy because you only have your body weight to work with, but it, it can do, uh, it can still convey quite a lot of benefit and just make you a healthier human and also a better athlete. It's all about the arm strength to body weight ratio and cyclists do not have a favorable ratio in that regard. <laughs> Power to weight may be good, but that one is bad. So <laughs> if that's the case, you can still get quite a lot. Uh, Matt's question, how does someone identify limiters? Assuming that the goal is the highest FTP possible. How do you know if endurance VO2 max, uh, peak power, muscle endurance, oxygen uptake, or something else is the current limiter? Sounds like a lot of things you're considering Matt. Um, and it's all, it, one thing limiters do have a way of making themselves apparent. First of all, uh, at least in, in my case, personally, I've noticed my limiters because they end up limiting me on race day. Now, in terms of getting into the exact mechanisms that are causing that sort of a thing, that's somewhat of a different deal. Um, but Chad, what would you, what would you say on this one? Well, you, you first have to recognize that there's a difference between physiological and performance limiters. So what you may think you need may not actually translate to better performance. And because of that, I, I start with performance and then I work backwards. I mean, you have to figure out what it is you're not good at. Am I not good at sustained climbs? Am I not good at punchy climbs? Am I not good at sprinting? Am I not good at time trialing and sustaining efforts over XX minutes? And then once you have that in mind, then you can look back and see what physiology shapes the adaptations that you're chasing. But I think it has to start with performance. You can't just say, I want the highest FTP possible because having a high FTP does not ensure you will be the fastest racer on the day. There's a lot of other things going on. So look at the performance, step backwards, figure out what needs to be addressed, reassess sure the performance. Helps. Sure helps a lot though. It sure helps. Yeah, it does. It does. It does. <laughs> yeah. High FTP can solve a lot of problems. That's for sure. But it, it doesn't can. necessarily it absolutely can. You, and you here's know, an analogy. Happens. You're, you're racing cars and you're a horrible car racer, but you've got so much horsepower. Good one. Imagine if you could do both, right? So if you have a whole, a really fast car, but you can't drive it, someone in a slower car that can drive it can totally beat you. And mm -hmm. same thing with bike racing, uh, skills involved, strategy, fueling, all that sort of stuff. But having both is the best a very fast a skilled driver like amber and a skilled uh uh or jonathan mountain the biking engine. And a, a good engine yes then you're the the best of both worlds yeah and I, i'll just say like as a word of caution in terms of you know starting with the performance and working backwards um every single year this happened to me my whole career i would do my first race after having 
spent a lot of time and a lot of work on all of my preseason prep and training and getting ready. And then I do the first race and I would be like, oh man, I suck at all of the things. Like I got to work on my sprinting. I got to work on my climbing. I got to work on my short path. Like you would, you just come away from that race and you're like, ah, all of the things are limiters and it's not true. So, um, be, you know, be, uh, mindful of that and then see if you can prioritize things in a way or work on one thing at a time. So once you sort of identify what things might be, you know, candidates as possible limiters, then pick one and work on it one at a time. And that's the the final thing that I would add to that is if you can't tell what your performance limiters are, do exactly what Amber just said, just pick something and work on that. Yeah. And then once you start to realize that, wow, that's gotten a lot better, move on to something else. And then you'll make yourself a well-rounded athlete, much more effective. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's when you get dropped. That's that's, that's when yeah, it's your limiter. That's the main. <laughs> sure. And then you can work right? on that's that. That's a pretty and good sign. if you never sign. get <laughs> dropped, you won. Yeah, there you go. Right. Exactly. But that's the definition you, you of winning. Might not be, you might not be dropped because of a fitness or a physiological thing. Like you might have the engine yeah. to not be dropped, but it might've been a timing thing, or maybe you know, there might be something tactical about it. That was the reason that you got dropped. So yeah, it, that's, it, it pays to be analytical about it. That's a good yes. point. The, the previous 40 minutes in the race, you put out too much energy and mm -hmm. you get dropped on a short hill. It has nothing to do with that short hill with your engine. It's the 40 minutes of bad tactics and uh, mm -hmm. not surfing the Peloton and stuff like that. Because right. almost everybody thinks their weakness is climbing. Well, like number one, climbing is hard for everybody. So there's that. Mm -hmm. It's never easy for everybody else and just hard for you. And then number two, the best way to make climbing really hard is to ride it efficiently beforehand. And then it'll be really hard. So it happens all the time. We get so many questions of people saying, how do I become a better climber? I always get dropped on the climbs. And in almost every scenario, if you focus on everything else other than the climb, then you'd probably see opportunities to improve. Okay. Cliff says, after listening to you for over one year and getting to know you and learning from you, I needed to support you or what you're doing. So thanks Cliff uh, for appreciate doing that. Just joined TR and signed up for my first year, had my first hundred mile mountain bike race in June. And I was excited to use plan builder because you plug it often after using plan builder. I was very nervous that the longest ride for my training plan was around an hour and 30 minutes. I hope to finish the hundred mile mountain bike race in about eight hours. I was totally planning on long rides during the weekends, but it's not in the plan. So now I just started sweet spot base and I'm just a little worried about what, what I should do moving forward. The last thing I need to do is not train properly for the next six months. Nate, you have, this, you have a great way to answer this one. Your Leadville experience. Yes. Well, uh, one, you don't have to, but, mm -hmm. um, it's probably beneficial. And if you look at the weekly tips that are on plan builder and you click on that chat has alternatives for long weekend rides, uh, for how, like what to do instead of sweet spot originally we had long rides in the plan nobody did them everyone was like <laughs> i'm not doing that kind of uh long indoor rides so uh you know what's better than not doing a ride is doing a sweet spot ride but if you will actually do it um then you can you can do it so it's a it's a choice and i know that's not as easy as it could be in the app it would be a lot better if we had hey you could do here are your choices today you could do a four hour outside ride or a two hour indoor sweet spot ride uh, here's your choice. And we could say a recommended one. We're not there yet. We got to do these other changes to our system, but that would be, uh, that'd be cool. And yeah, uh, personally, as we go into, uh, Cape Epic and longer rides, I'm going to do some longer, probably Sunday rides and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and do, I don't know. That's a, I don't yeah, need to talk about good way to manage it's it. pretty easy yeah and nate went uh sub nine at leadville on on almost all indoor work and it was two like two hours i think was your longest ride going into that so uh yeah i did two races two gravel races that were longer um and then everything else was two hour or less indoor rides there we go. Okay. James says, uh, thanks for the great podcast. Listen every week, An almost 53 year old rider who has got a goal to compete at single track six in September, 21, 2021. See you there, James. I'm excited for it. I'm already signed up. I used the plan builder and started training on the mid volume plan in September and am now on to the build phase. I also weight lift two times a week and it seems to be going well. My question is, would it be terribly regressive if I reduce my spring and summer plan from mid volume to low volume so I can mix in a couple of outdoor rides a week to practice skills and keep myself from burning out. Thanks again to Jonathan, uh, coach Chad, Amber and Nate for all the great content. I would absolutely recommend that. I think that's a great approach. And one cool thing that you can do is you can just click on wherever that training block starts in your calendar. It'll say, for example, something like general build or something like that, XCO, high volume, whatever it is, click on that. And then you can change the volume right there. 
Uh, it's super easy to do. And I think the approach of balancing things to give yourself more time to work on skills, much like Amber was doing all throughout the summer as well, uh, is that's really important, especially for a race like single track six, who it's, uh, that's going to be tricky technically speaking. So it's really good to make sure that you're comfortable with that sort of thing before you head into it. And that's why we build these plans with that sort of flexibility. Uh, so, and you can use calendar to exploit that, uh, flexibility and make it nice and easy. I think I lost Amber. Amber's muted. Yeah. Who oh, knew? No. <laughs> she is. Qu that's like the quote of 2020, right? You're on mute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> um, anyway, I was just going to say, I think it's really important to set time aside to focus on skills alone, because certainly every ride that you do is going to help and reinforce uh, those skills, especially if you're being mindful about it. But to take time aside where you're only focused on those skills is super mm -hmm. productive because you don't have the fatigue from interval training. You can really devote all of your cognitive energy to that focus and, and really absorbing those lessons. And so you can have a better quality of focus. Um, I think, I think that's such a great idea and that's something that the pros do as well. So, um, I had some friends that raced professional cyclocross, and this was something that was built into their training every week is they would go out and do rides that were a hundred percent skills. It wasn't about getting fitter. It wasn't about interval training. It was a hundred percent working on handling skills. And, and I think, yeah, it's a, it's a great idea. hundred mm -hmm. percent. It's, uh, this is, so hopefully this doesn't sound wrong, but I feel like it's a bit of like, almost like a, I start like a couple steps higher than a lot of people I race because of the fact of having worked on skills and done all of that stuff. My level of anxiety is so much lower. So that's actually like a, yeah. a thing that I, when I show up to a race and I look around at everybody, even if it's a lie, I tell myself I'm way more calm than all these people because I'm not concerned at all about what's on the course. And, uh, that really helps me go into the race more calm. I don't freak out as much at those sort of things because any energy expended ends up affecting how much energy you can put into those pedals, whether that's mm -hmm. mental energy, physical energy, anything else, it's all, it's all real. So as, as far as you and I go, that is a hundred percent true. I have anxiety <laughs> right? about all the rocks and the turns <laughs> and all that sort of stuff and crashing. And, uh, you look very calm. Yeah. It's, and we, I think all of us have probably noticed this first race of the season when we get back into something and you're in like, like that first criterion or first crazy pack of the year, it's overwhelming. Like mm -hmm. it takes me a little while to drop that mental arousal level to be able to focus, like filter all the chaos and just see what really matters. It, so it's, it, it bears, I guess, focus. It bears us uh, spending some time and focusing on it all the time. So mm -hmm. Shanna's question. This one I'm excited for. She says, love listening to your podcast every week. This is still rapid fire, by the way. Um, <laughs> love listening to your podcast. If, if you couldn't tell <laughs> during my week, to, on my long run, I have noticed improvements in my training since starting to feel more during tough or long sessions. However, I can't help but feel like I am just eating my way money. Each time I am on the bike gels are so expensive. Yo, Shanna, mm -hmm. I feel you. I've been thinking about this recently and like, <laughs> I think my truck is more economical per mile than I am sometimes on the bike. Like if I'm doing sweet spot work, <laughs> I'm spending more in like all the nutrition I'm putting in than I would be if I was just driving my car. It's just insane how expensive it is. So, um, do any of you have cost-effective ways of getting carbs in without endless bananas? Thanks to you all, especially Amber. Aww, uh, thank so you, Shanna. yeah, that's awesome. Um, uh, yeah, so we, we have some things down here and then we'll probably talk about like some DIY options that you can do as well to, to make it more, more, uh, I guess, approachable. Um, uh, but yeah, if somebody want to kick this off and, and jump in on, on different ones, like the first thing that we have listed here is figs, um, super high sugar mm -hmm. come from figs, right? Figs are easy. Mm -hmm. oh. Bananas. Go ahead, Chad. Mm -hmm. Bananas. Um, I, I have a few, yeah. Um, potatoes, I've, I've talked about this in the past. French fries, actually cold French fries left over from whatever your last <laughs> indulgence was. Put them in a bag and uh, they are amazingly welcome in the midst of a, a long ride, <laughs> especially they're salty. I mean, the, the carbohydrate in them is, is good. There's a little bit of fat, which is a little more satiating. Uh, I like little PB and J sandwiches. I think those are excellent. Mm -hmm. Light on the peanut butter, heavy on the jam. And I'm super big on pancakes. I always make extra pancakes. So pancake breakfast, I make sure there's three or four extra pancakes. A lot of the times there's fruit in them. Sometimes there's not, but those are really portable and they're really good, yes. quick carbohydrate. 
you mm-hmm. can make a, the pancake for the size of your jersey pocket. It's incredible. Yeah, and totally then it can. just fits right in there in a Ziploc <laughs> bag. It's just the best. And and they also, they're the sort of thing that like temperature does not matter with the pancake. It's it's no. always going to be good. So yeah, that they're they're durable, I guess, in that respect. <laughs> Amber, how about you? <laughs> I really like gummy bears, in particular the Haribo brand. Um, and speaking of temperature, they just get so nice and warm in your pocket, so they're all soft. <laughs> I love the gummy bears. Perfect for um, sharing. <laughs> <laughs> just a glob of stuff yeah, to get warm gummies. gummies. <laughs> a heater I do know. <laughs> <laughs> so gross. Next question is going to be way more gross. I apologize, everybody, but yeah. <laughs> man um but yeah those are those are super good and and it's always something i look forward to too i think that's an important component Mm -hmm. if 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 it's something that you enjoy eating when you're on the bike and you look forward to it then you're more likely to fuel yourself well when you're riding so um Mm -hmm. those are those are ones and then i also do some homemade rice cakes once in a while we can get into that in more detail if if we want to wait on that for a second actually no we uh i think that that's a great option to cover because if you look at it they can actually be pretty affordable just rice Mm -hmm. And then uh, what do you add to yours, Amber? You can go a lot of different directions. And the nice thing about the rice cakes, so when I'm talking about rice cakes is you just cook rice and you can use the glutinous rice um, if you want to, but you don't have to. But once the rice is cooked, then you just kind of mash it out flat into a baking sheet. So you kind of have just like what amounts to sort of a square cake of rice. And then you cut it into squares and you can mix in all kinds of different flavors. So you could go savory or sweet, which is kind of a nice thing. Cause sometimes when you're on a ride, you don't really want sweets, mm-hmm. but you might want something salty and savory. So I know people that have, um, you know, little bits of bacon in there. You can mix in fruit, blueberries. Um, somebody I know made a really good batch that was like blueberries and fresh mint. It was super good. Ooh. So you can, you almost, I mean, the, the, the sky is the limit in terms of the flavor profiles that you can create. You can get like a 50 pound bag of rice for for peanuts like it's Mm -hmm. it is pretty economical and then adding in flavor if you want to and you don't have to because the rice itself is um is a good carbohydrate source so that's a good option one thing i want to point out with all this is that it's intensity dependent for me like Mm -hmm. i can't take it down a rice cake if i'm doing higher intensity stuff like even sweet spot i'd rather not um, mm-hmm. I'd rather take down something that's more liquid gel sort of a, a thing because it's harder for me to process that sort of food. I can also get in a huge amount of carbohydrates, uh, in something that's like liquid or gel, something like that. Nate, sorry, yeah. I interrupted. No, no, you did not interrupt. Uh, sorry, Shanna. I said bananas, even though you said specifically don't mention bananas. So that's why Chad <laughs> laughed bananas or it was Amber. I forget. Um, this is what I've done and it's, it's very, it's easy. You get maltodextrin and you get fructose and you weigh it out in a two to one ratio. Five pounds of maltodextrin is $23 to drink five pounds of maltodextrin (laughs) takes a long time. Um, and then you add some salt to it and you can measure that out to see how much, uh, sodium you want. It's, it's, it works great. It's cheap. The only thing that's a little bit difficult is the maltodextrin will clump in cold water. So, um, use like, uh, mix it first, a little bit of hot water and shake it really well. And once that's diluted, then you can add your extra water and ice, but it's Mm an extremely cheap way to get, there's just no flavoring to it, but Mm -hmm. extremely cheap way to get carbs, um, which is awesome. And John, we are going to do a long gravel ride on Saturday with Mm Pete. Should we get, see, this is, this is key. We trained our admin here, how to make rice cakes for the company. And she hasn't been doing it because of COVID, but, uh, I could, we could make some sweeter, savory rice cakes and then I could bring them to the, should I do that? Let's, let's do that. Cause the intensity tends to be lower on that sort of a ride. We are probably going to do a 10 mile TT against all three of us at some point in that ride. We have to, um, but other than that, it'll be lower intensity and that'll be perfect fuel. I love the savory ones. That's a good point. This might be a race. So (laughs) <laughs> me, you and Pete. <laughs> Maybe I'll stick with the maltodextrin drink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It makes it a little oh, bit man. easier, but man, th- there, there is something good about having a balance like that. Just to reiterate what Nate said, I think that there's a, if more of us bought bulk maltodextrin and fructose and chances are you have salt in your house, it's, it makes everything way more affordable. It's something that I'm hoping to do. Like I, like I use, I've used Martin and I've used all these different ones. There's just that, and they work really well, but they're so expensive. It's just not feasible to be able to continue to spend that much all the time. 
So, uh, but if you look at it in most cases, uh, science points towards simpler is easier, like a more simple ingredient list is easier for your body to process. There's uh, t- the two to one ratio of glucose to fructose makes it pretty easy to be able to tolerate things in most cases and uh, some salt, just step your way up. And then you can find yourself mixing something that's, you know, 90 grams of carbs an hour or something like that. And you can take it in and it's going to be a lot cheaper. So uh, let's go. I-, I feel like that conversation would be awesome in the forum. So if you want to ask questions about this, jump in, head over to the forum. And this is episode 289. You can figure out more stuff on that. Uh, Alan's question. I have not, and this is, we're now out of rapid fire. (laughs) Strangely, (laughs) Alan says, I have an odd question for the team and some may find this unpalatable. Buckle up. Everybody says, however, it's an issue that's been frustrating me for some years now. It's regarding to excessive mucus production during exercise that is causing me to spit constantly. I first noticed this problem or only recall this issue during a 2015 half Ironman during the run portion of the event and tackled it down or tacked it down as nutrition issues that I wasn't familiar with, which is absolutely possible. By the way, uh, you take something that your body isn't familiar with. You could even have an allergy to that and that can happen. However, since then the problem has persisted. It's most bothersome now because I have started for the first time training indoors. And as you can imagine, having to having the need to spit indoors is unpleasant for everyone, including myself. And especially with COVID-19. I've tried changing my diet and exercise supplements to see if this makes a difference, but it seems, but it doesn't seem to change the outcome massively. I'm afraid this is ultimately taking away from all the effort I've been putting into improving my performance. So what are your advices or what is your advice on managing this issue? And do you know of others that have managed this? Please help. And thanks from Alan. So, um, this is the first time, one of the first times I get to say, I have science to back this up everybody. So, um, (laughs) I did a, I did a mini deep dive on this one. Yeah, a chat, Chad Jr. over here. So, um, and with this one, yeah, you're not alone. First of all, I think all of us have experienced this at some point or another, right? Um, it, it all, and you're not alone. Athletes do this a lot of the time, but I think it benefits us to look at the mechanism behind this, like what's actually going on, and then we'll look at what some of the research says uh, to try to gain glean some sort of insight for uh, mucus production in athletes. So, first of all, uh, we all make mucus that happens. And it's a good thing. In fact, we almost make, or it's assumed that we make on average of a liter per day. So that's a lot of mucus, but the point of doing this is our body uses it to moisturize and protect against potentially damaging irritants. So for example, that could be something like pollution in the air, or that could be very cold air, or that could be any sort of uh, discomfort that we experience from anything that's passing through nasal passages and into our body. So uh, allergies included, definitely. And that will be a theme of what we'll talk about here. Now, the cause of excess mucus is it's just a response to irritants or allergies. Once again, mucus is made there to be able to protect us. So when it senses something like that, it produces more of it to be able to stop that. In specific terms, this is referred to as rhinitis. So uh, we should define that. Rhinitis is the inflammation of nasal tissue that often results in a few different things. Number one, runny nose. That's probably the most common. Decreased nasal respiratory flow, so swelling that exists within that. And then also increased post-nasal drip, which is rhinitis just comes out the back instead of the front, right? So that's when you have a cold, you'll really notice post-nasal nasal drip more often or allergy season, anything like that, even though it's always happening. Uh, we're always producing mucus and it's going out the front or the back of our nose. That's just what it is. So now rhinorrhea is a different term or rhinorrhea, however you want to say it. It's synonymous with the runny nose, but more especially the thin, mostly clear nasal discharge that we get out of our nose. And once again, post-nasal drip is just that, but over the back of our throat. So we, I'm sure that all of us have seen this. If you've been riding with a person with yourself or somebody else, but when you get just a steady drip from your nose or somebody else does when they're riding or exercising, and, uh, it's annoying to the person that's experiencing it. It may be annoying to the onlookers as well, uh, if they're experiencing that, but it's actually really common. Yeah. I mean, it's so common that most cycling gloves come with a nice little terry cloth patch right there <laughs> on your hand so that you can effectively wipe and have a little more absorbency there. So yeah, very common problem. The snot wipe pad, right? Um, yes. funny story with this really quick gloves that have that ski gloves actually also have a squeegee a lot of the time on their thumb. That is for your goggles, not for your nose. <laughs> <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was with a friend skiing one time and he was using the squeegee on his nose. I'm like, no, 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 that's all wrong. Don't do that. So if you have gloves with the squeegee, it's for your cockles, not for your nose. Okay. So we have, uh, rhinitis, we have rhinorrhea and we have post-nasal drip all defined. 
So here are some studies that actually have looked into this. And just a side note, this is a really good example. I was looking at a bunch of different studies and all the studies, they would have good insights, but then they would always seem to have some strange outcome or strange conclusion based on data that just didn't make sense. And in most cases, a lot of these were just cross-sectional surveys or, or, or self-observed or self, self-delivered self surveys that were actually performed with a group of athletes. So there's always a lot of things that are could potentially be working themselves in there that would give you unsound data. So it's always tricky. So I was finding a lot of like conflicting data points and things that didn't make sense. And then I found a fantastic review that was published in 2016 by Serta, Siarnik et al. And they went through and they searched the PubMed for everything that they could find on rhinitis. And then they had a much more clear and concise way of looking at this. So if you're ever finding results that just don't seem to make sense, continue to search and hopefully you can find something like a review like this. So anyways, they reviewed 373 articles that, uh, that existed within PubMed that all mentioned rhinitis. Only 13 of those fit the criteria that they had. And they said this, we found 10 studies that reported the prevalence of allergic rhinitis, 21% to 56.5%. In contrast, non-allergic rhinitis was identified by the uh, author in only, or by only one author. So we're this is all going to make sense as to why we're talking about allergies and rhinitis in just a little bit here. Um, but what they did with this, uh, they took all the data that they had from all these different studies that they could actually rely on. And then they put them into different subgroups and they found that for land athletes, water, air, water athletes, and cold air athletes, they separated those into the, those, those three buckets, 21 to 49% of land athletes said that they experienced rhinitis, rhinitis or showed ex symptoms of that. And interestingly, that's not very different from what you see in the average population. So this tackles an assumption that exists that, oh, athletes experience this more often than others, when actually it's not necessarily true. It's just the activity that we're doing that can cause it. We'll get into that. However, water athletes looking at you, Amber, they experience it 40 to 74%. And there's a reason behind this. And we'll get into that in just a little bit here, but really it's chlorine being an irritant and causing a reaction. Nate. For those who don't know, swimmers are disgusting. They just go in the pool and they blow, <laughs> double blow their nose snot and then try to push it into the drain. It, Amber <laughs> backed me up. Like they kind of like, like they grab it Chad's and it's face. like that first scene in Ghostbusters Disgusting. where like he has the slime on his hand, Bill Murray, Aww. and he's trying to like rub it and they put it over to the, the drain in an elevator. and they kind of put okay. it in there. <laughs> <laughs> Amber, that's what they do though, right? Like I, I don't hear any lies. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly, 40 to 74% of water athletes, swimmers, basically all experience or exhibit some sort of signs of rhinitis. And that's assumed that it has to do with the chlorine being an irritant. And as a result, you experience inflammation and then that's what causes this. And then cold air athletes. So think like ski mountaineering, cross country skiing, uh, anything like that. They actually experience it as well. Pretty similarly around 46% and cold is known to be an irritant to the nasal passages, cold, dry air in particular, and causes swelling, which then causes rhinitis causes everything else. So the question then it arises is the reason that you're experiencing this just solely tied to allergies. And there's a kind of a common thing that I've heard where people will say, oh yeah, well, the reason you have a runny nose is because you're outside exercising amongst all of the pollen and allergies that exist out there. So uh, Silver's Pool back in 2006, they had a study with 164 subjects that was actually included in this review. And they had a group of, of, of people that experienced allergies and actually were receiving medication for that. And then a control group that were not experiencing that. They had them trained indoors and they had them trained outdoors, both groups, which is pretty cool to see. 40% of these people reported that they experienced some sort of exercise induced rhinitis when they were training inside. And 56% of them experienced it when they were training outside. So more experienced it when they were outside. But the conclusion that's important here is that outside is worse, but pollen and seasonally related allergies are not the sole cause because they still experienced it inside. So back to the review of and this lack of data on allergic response to rhinitis and non-allergic response or, or created rhinitis. This is an important detail. Um, exercise induced rhinitis and allergic rhinitis are coexist very regularly. And this actually brings me back to a point that Amber made back in episode 280, when we were talking about asthma and athletes, I think it was Amber, perhaps it was Chad as well. Um, but we were talking all about that and how asthma trends very commonly and it's, it coexists very much with, with athletes that are doing these sort of things. So in other words, let's wrap this up. 
what this tells us is that rhinitis, so the reason that you have a runny nose or create excess mucus is a reaction to some sort of pollutant or some sort of irritant on your nasal passages. So this could be as much as something that you're breathing in, or it could even be causes from a chronic food allergy. You're just taking something in, you haven't realized it, and it's something that's uh, causing a problem. So if you are experiencing something where you're producing more than you used to, then I would look into something like some sort of allergy testing, everything else. But probably the best way to do this is to go to an ENT. Um, and, and actually, I've, we'll get to that in a bit. But what I guess if I want to lay down the actual recommendation, this is from a study uh, from Dirkstra and Ainsley in 2011. And they say intranasal corticosteroids, so sprays a lot of the time, which you see, are, are highly recommended in the management drug of choice for athletes in conjunction with second-generation antihistamines he says, and when, and when practicable allergic avoidance. But if you look at this, a bunch of nasal ster like corticosteroid sprays, a lot of them will be, will be on the banned list from WADA. So you really have to uh, be careful if you're experiencing something like this, uh, humidifiers can help if you're training in a dry environment, all that stuff. But once again, if you go to an ENT, they'll probably be able to walk you through this better than, uh, than just flying by the seat of your pants. And that's actually what you did, right? Nate, uh, you've done that multiple times to try to solve this problem multiple times, lots of ENT visits. Uh, okay. So I have exercise induced rhinitis. I, this room you see here, I basically live in this room. Sometimes I <laughs> ate three meals in this room. I exercise in this room. I work in this room. Uh, there's a lot of time in this room. I get, I have absolutely no drippy nose in this room unless I am working out. And in, while I am working out on that trainer back there, uh, 20 Kleenex is easy per workout, like 20 Kleenex hmm. an hour. It is just running the whole time. Um, actually, a uh, an ENT listening to this podcast first put me onto this, so thank you. Um, is ipratoprium spray, spray? Ipratoprium spray. I think I said that right. Hopefully, you can put it in the forum. But mm -hmm. uh, that for me reduces about fifty percent of symptoms. Some uh, listeners who ask their ENT, it's a prescription only, so you have to ask your ENT. Um, they said that they were, uh, they had like amazing relief and it changed their life. So that's one thing you spray it before you do a workout. You can't do it every day cause there's this rebound effect, but maybe before workouts, it's okay. I don't know. Talk to your ENT. Mm. The second thing I've gone, yeah, Amber. Oh, nothing. No, sorry. I was just uh, <laughs> moving hair out of my face. I was just going to ask what's an ENT, Nate? Uh, mm -hmm. ear, nose and throat doctor. Yep. Thanks cool. Chad. Good clarification. Chad, just knows those who didn't know. <laughs> Chad knows the answer to that, just so you know. Uh, yeah, he just, he's just, he just clarifying just it for all of yes. us. <laughs> it's to help the conversation. And then the second thing I've done, which was a little like very much more extreme, is there is a nerve in the back of your nose that produces this mucus. And I'm probably saying the exact way this happens wrong. But basically what the ENT did said, if we freeze this thing and kill it, you're not going to have as runny nose. So mm. I went into the ENT's... Uh, office, the same one that did the balloons in my nose, by the way, those have been amazing for me personally, took these really long needles, stuck them in and mm. tried to numb it. But then when they froze it, man, this thing was so painful, like way more painful than any other awake procedure I've had. And it was painful for like hours later on my teeth and stuff. But anyways, they freeze the nerve with some, like, I think it's liquid nitrogen and it kills it. And then after a couple of days, it stopped not to hurt. And guess what it did to me? Nothing. Oh, it didn't gosh. help at all. I still go through tons. So, uh, I really don't even use the spray that much. Cause I, I don't know, it's maybe 12 Kleenexes versus 20, but I, yeah. I get a lot of it and it's just, I think I'm just going to live with it for the rest of my life. This is, this goes back to a lot of what Chad was talking about before with inflammation. Uh, inflammation is a response to exercise and that's, uh, the systemic all the way across our whole body that happens. So when you experience something like this, a lot of it is because Number one, you're exercising and it's a response. Uh, you're breathing in a lot of air rapidly. Many times that air can be dry. As a result, you create more mucus. Also, as you're breathing in more stuff, you're also bringing more pollutants, more things that coming across that your body may find as an irritant. So oh. that's really why it happens uh, in terms of if it, you deem it too much, like Nate said, probably best approach is to talk to an ENT. Amber. And before, before <laughs> sorry, ahead, Amber, I, I have to say this because someone's already said it in the chat and I, will, I just get messages all the time. I have stopped dairy for many, many months, I think four months and no change whatsoever. Um, yep. I know for some people, dairy is an allergen, but for me, uh, based on, I was, I was like, so I was extremely strict for, yeah. I think four months and yeah, no, no difference at all. 
Yeah. That was even, there's even a study and it, it has some questionable uh, methods throughout it, but there's even a study that looks into whether, al- whether dairy itself is a cause of excess mu- mucus production uh, because that's such a common assumption, Nate. And really it just boils down to allergies. If it is indeed an allergy that you experience, then yeah, it will affect it. But otherwise uh, it's not worth uh, pointing to it. So Amber, sorry. I just have a terrible story to share um, that might make people <laughs> feel better about... <laughs> They're running noses. <laughs> so um, when I was a swimmer, one of the main drills that we worked on was underwater dolphin kick on your back, because this is in particular a really fast way to move through the water, being in streamline and doing dolphin kick on your back. And it's so fast, actually, that when athletes first started doing this, um, it gave too much of an advantage. So they limited the distance per length that an athlete's allowed to do dolphin kick underwater on their back. So in backstroke events, for example, you can only do this for 15 meters. Otherwise, if you did the whole race underwater and some athletes did this before the regulation, it was just crazy fast and it was too much of an advantage. So (laughs) needless to say, this is something we do all the time, but you can imagine if you're in streamline on your back, both of your hands are in streamline, you can't plug your nose. So there's only two options. (laughs) One is you blow air out your nose the whole time, but that's really hard to do if you're trying to do a full length underwater on your back. Um, It takes a lot of lung control and there's really not enough air to, you you can't basically create enough air pressure to keep water from going up your nose. What I discovered was I could actually pull water into my nose on purpose. And if I pulled water into my nose far enough, it would fill my sinus cavity and the pressure would equilibrate. So water wasn't passing in and out of my nasal passages anymore. And it was just this perfect pressure equilibration and it actually felt really comfortable. I know this sounds completely bonkers, but this is a true story. So we would have morning practice before I would go to class, right? We'd get up in the morning, we'd have more morning practice at five in the morning. So I'd be doing my underwater drills and I would just literally suck water up through my nose into my sinus. And then when I was done with workout, I'd be in the locker room or wherever. And I'd kind of bend over and try to get as much of the water out. It's really hard to get all of the water out of your sinus cavity. For some reason, it just doesn't want to come out all at once. So, (laughs) um, yeah, I would be in class leaning over my notebook a few hours later and (laughs) with the morning, like I'd get quarter cup, half a cup of pool water, just (laughs) dumping straight on my (laughs) notebook. And yeah, I mean, it was, I tried really hard to avoid that, but it's just, there's, there's something like you just, you can't get it all to come out at one time. And so it was just sort of like a, all right, it's going to happen at some point during class at some point this morning. I just don't know when, don't know which class. (laughs) How often were you sick? (laughs) Um, not sick. Actually, I want to say that the chlorine actually had kind of a, a protective effect. Catch me, catch me. Catch me in a pool all winter. It's perfect. <laughs> she, she had bleach sitting in her sinuses. So yeah. uh, what she just said. <laughs> Gotta be healthy. <laughs> people do uh, people do sinus rinses, right? And so when I do a sinus rinse, I experience the same thing. And after I had my two nasal surgeries and actually the balloons, the draining got a lot better mm. to that point. I think that's too why some people get sinus infections is they have a little bit of pooling of fluid in there that they can't yep. get out. Um, but the trick to this that I've done, cause I do this in the shower is you, you bend over, you turn, and then you turn your head forward and it's, you, yeah. you look on YouTube, you can kind of see it, but that is the key thing to really get it to drain. Um, yeah. and my second point is, do you two guys realize how much Amber is going to destroy us on the swim? <laughs> and be so bad. Jonathan was like, what's butterfly? Like, what's dolphin <laughs> but she I was mean, like dolphin, dolphin on kick. your back. I'm like, what are you like, talking what about? <laughs> um, it is going to be, it's going to be like how, when I started mountain biking against John, like the, the difference <laughs> in skill yeah. level, which brings to my next point. When are we going to do triathlon? Because 20 COVID kind of slowed down some stuff. Mm-hmm. Do we, uh, do you know, do you have any the, thoughts on that? The plan was the plan. We like thought that we would do it 2021. Then we thought we'd do it 2022, but I feel like it's either 2022 or 2023. But that I has think, age implications, I think, for one of us. I think that we bump it's up. It's good ones. It's Yeah, we want to yeah. bump up. So I want to be <laughs> I bump up. Yeah. yeah, both of us do. You, you're 40, yeah. I'm 50. So 2022, yeah. then. That gives me one year to do a Cat 1 upgrade in a COVID year where there's going to be no crits. 
which is very hard. <laughs> but Amber, the good news is is that triathlon gels pretty well with our tandem world championship. Uh, <laughs> totally. Run. Because it, I mean, it is 40k TT, 40k power, or 30k it's power, true. whatever they do. It'll I mean, we awesome. can do tandem Ironman too, right? That's a thing. That would be sick. <laughs> <I'm totally kidding. laughs> if I can, if I can like hook a belt up to Amber so she can pull me along through the water, I'm doing tandem for sure. Um, you could be a para guide. That's actually a good point. Is you can yeah. do Ironman oh, yeah. para guide. Actually, that would be cool. That would be really. Amber, cool. you'd be really sweet. cool because on the swim, you'd be a great guide, uh, and then on the bike, you would be great power. And then I don't know if do they do gender matched para guide uh, para guides or not. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's specific. Yeah. Well, then we could switch you out with somebody on the run. <laughs> a a Amber would be like giving you happy halfways the whole way through. It would be fantastic. <laughs> <Yep>. So, <laughs> totally. <laughs> All right. Last question is from George. Uh, this one, he says, uh, calling from New Zealand, there's been a lot of talk on the podcast about beetroot concentrate as a performance enhancer. However, I'm starting to see a lot of science come out around black current concentrates. Example given, uh, he says, Cura NZ. That suggests that black currants, especially New Zealand grown varieties, hence my interest, may have similar or better properties than beetroot in terms of increased blood flow, delayed lactate accumulation, et cetera, which also it's worth saying that uh, the delayed lactate accumulation, there's a whole lot of things that are tied to beetroots by companies that uh, beetroot juice or concentrate that don't necessarily play out. Once again, when we're talking about mechanism and we're talking about performance improvement, uh, uh, nutrition products are certainly not devoid of that sort of problem that you have with logic leaps. It definitely exists. So having only a limited amount of stomach space on race day, do you have any thoughts on the similarities, differences, pros and cons of beetroot versus black currants? Chad, you dug into this for us. Yeah, I did. I didn't, I didn't go terribly deep, but I did look into it enough to satisfy my own curiosity and I hope render a, a decent answer. So <laughs> the, I guess the draw with beetroot concentrate or beetroot, yeah, beetroot concentrate or beetroots themselves is that they're high in nitrates. So the end product of nitrate metabolism is NO. So NO3 into the mouth, NO2 gets converted to NO2 in the mouth, gets converted to NO. So nitrous oxide in the blood vessels. And what this does is exerts a vasodilative effect. So your blood vessels widen or get a bit more supple, combination of both, don't know, but basically you can push more blood to the muscle and that's what we're looking for. More oxygen delivery. Beets are high in nitrates, black currants, not so much. <clears throat> and initially, <clears throat> excuse me, initially this is, this was, I, th I thought was the end of the discussion. Turns out black currants are high in anthocyanins and anthocyanins are flavonoids in particular, they're polyphenols, or maybe they're, I don't know what, what the hierarchy is there, but point is they also convey vasoeffective effects. So they may not be high in nitrates, but they, high, they are high in these anthocyanins, which do the same thing. And one of those things is that they decrease the mean arterial blood pressure. So less blood pressure. Again, you can push, push more blood. And again, they increase vasodilation, bigger blood vessels, bigger means of conveyance to get oxygen to the muscle. Other purported benefits to, uh, to endurance performance are actually many. And, and you listed one of them that I'll get to, but um, black currants are very high in uh, it's, it's PP. So there's like polyphenol, polyphenolic phytochemicals or phytochemical polyphenols. I don't know. Let's just call them polyphenols. They convey antioxidant effects, ring a bell. Um, and they do it both mm -hmm. directly and indirectly. Uh, other purported benefits are that they, they regulate signaling effects. I didn't dig into what that is, but it sounds pretty good. Neuroprotective <laughs> effects. So <laughs> the brain, regulatory <laughs> metabolic effects. So back to those redox reactions and positive effects on gut health. None of these things sound, uh, they all sound pretty good. And yes, decreased lactate production. In the one study I did look at, they saw less and less lactate, or not less and less lactate, but they saw decreases in lactate production all the way up to 70% of VO2 max, you know, which we're talking in the ballpark of 85%, and it doesn't, 85% of FTP. And it doesn't mean that we wouldn't see further increases above 70%, that's just all the higher they went. So who knows, maybe, maybe it carries. Um, and then numerous studies reporting all forms of improved performance, all, for, all, all types of little tweaks or improvements in performance attributable specifically to increased black current intake. So my reply is why not? You know, outside of the expense, eating more fruits and vegetables is seldom a bad idea. Mm. This is, brings up a good point. Chances are, if you look into any sort of whole food, natural food, you will find benefits toward health and toward <laughs> performance even, right? Like that, that's an, an important detail 
a lot mm-hmm. of products then get market marketed very heavily and productized like the food does into being like uniquely advantageous for, for, for performance. But in many cases, if you did any sort of a deep dive like this into any sort of uh, natural food like this, you'll probably find some sort of benefit for it. So the, yeah, like you said, Chad, the take home lesson, eat natural whole foods, uh, bring them in, eat a variety, a good nutritious diet. And as a result, you'll get lots of benefits from all the different stuff. Nate's probably ordering some up right now. (laughs) (laughs) I actually thought I was like, I shouldn't type right at this moment. (laughs) Pulling out his Uh, card on screen. (laughs) Yeah. So this is a concentrate. I don't know. I, yeah, probably, probably, but also, uh, well, I'd probably just eat them. I don't know. I have to find out how much it is because of what our talk is before. If we do the, uh, the nationals, right? And then if you win, you get tested. I would hate for a concentrate of black current to cause me to like totally damage train a road and myself for the rest of my life, where I bet you I could just sure. eat them straight and be mm-hmm. just fine. But it might yeah, be sure. like, well, like how tart cherries are. It's like 200 in a bottle or something and I have to eat, but I'm pretty good at eating. So I think I can, I'll make it work. <laughs> They're delicious World for class. what it's worth. I love them. Um, if you put them into like uh, pancakes, even oatmeal, whatever you're like uh, breakfast, they're, they're fantastic with that. Also, San Pellegrino makes a delicious little like a uh, bubbly drink with it in there too. So mm. more excuse for me to drink bubbly water. Okay. <laughs> so thanks everybody for joining us on this week's, of the, well, this week's episode of the podcast. Thanks Chad for doing so much deep dive stuff this week. Mm-hmm. You did a ton. Uh, thanks okay. for doing the heavy, the heavy lifting, no pun intended um, <laughs> for us on that one. And then also, uh, thank you for joining us, everybody on YouTube. Remember, you can give us a thumbs up. That would help a ton. And if you're listening to this podcast, share it with another cyclist. Let them know this week uh, as a Christmas present to us. That would be super helpful. And uh, happy holidays to everybody. We'll have a a short, abbreviated, uh, very different sort of an episode next week. And then we'll be back the week after with now the surprise that I think Nate or the announcement that I think Nate understands that I'm going to make. Which, will you be here on that episode, Nate? Or you'll be gone, won't you? What day will it be? Uh, it'll be the final day of December. I won't be here. Oh, we, we might have to wait for the announcement then. Cause you need to be here for that. <laughs> I'll be here. Yeah. The next week I'll be here. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll, we'll make my announcement wait then. So, cause Nate has to be there for this one. So he has many much excited to be able to talk about this. So, okay, everybody. Thanks so much. And we'll talk to you on the trainer road forum and next time on the podcast. Take care. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Happy holidays. See ya. <laughs>